Chapter thirty eight of Forest Days by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty eight. It was evening, but one day remained to pass away before the arrival of that appointed for the wager of battle, and all Nottingham had been in hurry and confusion with the excitement of the approaching spectacle. The residence of the king in the castle had already filled the town fuller than it was ever known to be before but now a still greater influx of people poured into it from all the country round to witness a transaction which combined all the splendour and display of one of the military pageants of the day with the interest of a deep tragedy the citizens had flocked out of the town during the morning to see the preparation of the lists parties of pleasure had been made to the spot where the deadly struggle was to take place and mirth and merriment had surrounded the scene where two fellow creatures were soon to appear armed for mutual destruction, where bright hopes and fair prospects were to be blighted, and death and sorrow to share the victory. No tidings had been received by Hugh de Mothama from his forest friends. No circumstance had transpired which could aid him in proving his innocence, or could fix the guilt upon another. Prince Edward was evidently anxious and uneasy, and the only person who seemed pleased with the whole affair was the king himself, who, affecting a dignified grace and calmness, and declaring that he assumed the young lord of Mothama to be innocent till he was proved guilty, treated him with courtesy, and even with distinction. It was the pampering of a gladiator before sending him into the arena, for the secret of Henry's good humour was that he was pleased at the excitement and satisfied with those who contributed to it. Not to show favour, however, as one of the most favourite ridden monarchs as ever lived thought fit to term it, he sent expressly to invite the young Earl of Ashby to repair with his train to Nottingham Castle, and partake of the royal hospitality before the combat, and Allured had already arrived, and taken possession of the apartments prepared for him. He had twice met with Hugh de Mothama, once in the hall, when many others were present, and once in the court when they were nearly alone their meeting had been watched by the frivolous and malicious always so numerous in courts who hoped and expected to see some outburst of angry feeling which might afford amusement for the passing hour but in this they were altogether disappointed the two adversaries saluted each other with grave courtesy and it was particularly remarked that allured's fierce impetuosity and somewhat insolent pride were greatly softened down and moderated. Nay more, when his eyes lighted upon Hugh de Mothama, the expression was more sad than stern, and some thought that there was hesitation in it also. "'It is clear enough,' said Sir Harry Gray to Sir William Geary, "'it is clear enough he doubts the truth of the charge he has made. He does not think the Mothama guilty.' "'He knows that some one must be guilty,' answered the other, "'and that is generally enough for an Ashby "'to make him vent his rage upon the first thing near.' "'But what has become of his good cousin Dickon?' demanded Gray. "'I have not seen him all day, nor yesterday either.' "'I suppose he keeps at Lindwell,' replied Sir William Geary, "'or else has gone to his new manor of Cottington. "'People look cold on him. I know not why.' "'There are two or three reasons why,' said Sir Harry Gray. First, it is evident that this charge is his, his hatching, "'and yet he puts the fighting part upon his cousin.' "'And very wise, too,' exclaimed Sir William Geary. First, because Hugh de Mothama would break his neck "'as a man does a rabbit with his little finger. "'Next, because there is but one between him and the earldom of Ashby, "'and a good lance and a fair field is very likely to diminish the number.' "'It is just possible,' said Gray, "'that he may have taken means to diminish the number already.' Sir William Geary shrugged his shoulders significantly, but made no other answer, and the conversation dropped. Such as it was, however, it was a fair specimen of many others that took place in Nottingham that day. But Richard de Ashby heard them not, for he was many miles away, deep in conference with his companion, Ellaby, who remained to watch the progress of events hidden in the wild and mountainous parts of Derbyshire. 
Nevertheless, that night, towards seven o'clock, when everyone in Nottingham had returned home from the sightseeing and amusements of the day, and all was profoundly quiet, both in the castle and the town, two armourers who sat burnishing a magnificent hauberk in the outer chamber of the young Earl of Ashby's apartments in Nottingham Castle were interrupted by someone knocking at the door. In a loud voice they bade the visitor come in, and in a moment after the brown face and head of an old woman were thrust into the room, asking to see the Earl of Ashby. The two men had been going on merrily with their work, giving no thought or heed to the bloody purposes which the weapons under their hands were to be applied to, nor of the danger that their lord ran, should that linked shirt of mail prove insufficient to repel the lance of an enemy. They looked up then, as cheerfully as if the whole were a matter of sport, and one of them replied, "'He will not receive you, good dame, seeing you are old and ugly. Had you been young and pretty, by my faith, you would have found admission right soon. What is it that you wish?' "'I wish to tell him,' answered the old woman, "'that he is wanted immediately down at the house of Sir Richard de Ashby.' "'Well, well,' cried the man, "'I will tell him. Get thee gone, and close the door after thee, for the night's wind is cold.' Thus saying, he went on with his work, and seemed to have no inclination to break off, for the purpose of carrying any messages whatsoever. "'Come, come,' cried his companion, "'you must tell my lord.' Oh, that will do an hour hence he replied to-morrow morning will be time enough if i like it what should richard de ashby want with my lord borrow money i dare say some jew has got him by the throat and won't let him go there let him stay nasty vermin nay nay then i will go said his brother armourer rising and proceeding into another chamber where several yeomen and a page were sitting to the latter of whom he delivered the message and then returned to his work the young Earl of Ashby was seated in an inner room, with but one companion, when the old woman's commission was at length executed. "'I am glad to hear he has returned,' he said, as the page closed the door. "'I wonder he comes not hither, but I will go and speak with him. My mind misgives me, Sir Guy, my mind misgives me. And what you say does not convince me. My sister knows better. Lucy is truth itself. Remember, sir, I have to swear that my quarrel is just.' that I believe, so help me, God, that my charge is true. I doubt it, Guy de Margan, I doubt it. If you can give new proof, speak. But tis useless to repeat over and over again what I have heard before, and what has been refuted. It may be that your cousin, my lord, can furnish you with new proof, said Guy de Margan. Tis on that account, perhaps, he has sent for you. I will go directly, cried the earl starting up i will go directly but where does he live in nottingham i thought he was in the castle with the rest or at, or at our lodging in the town down at the house of sir richard de ashby where may that be i wonder i can show you my lord answered guy de margan tis half a mile hence no more tell me tell me replied the earl i will go by myself i will put you in the way my lord said his companion and leave you when you are in the street. You will never find it by yourself. Giving him but little thanks for his courtesy, the young earl strode into the ante-room, and with none but a page to carry his sword, and Guy de Margan by his side, issued forth into the court of the castle, and thence through the gates into the dark streets of Nottingham. "'Had you not better have a torch, my lord?' said Guy de Margan. "'No, no,' replied the earl. "'Tis but that our eyes are not accustomed to the obscurity. "'We have no time to wait for torches. "'The hour of supper will be here anon.' "'Down the first flight of steps, my lord,' said Guy de Margan. "'Let us not miss the mouth of the alley. "'Oh, tis here!' "'And hurrying on with a quick step, "'the two gentlemen and their young attendant "'descended to the lower part of the town, "'and entered the street in which Richard de Ashby "'had hired the house we have so often mentioned.' When they had proceeded some way down it, the young earl asked, with even more than his usual impatience, "'Are we not near it yet?' "'Yes, my good lord,' replied Guy de Margan. "'You can now find it for yourself, I doubt not. "'Tis the first small house standing back between two large ones, with eaves shooting far over into the street. 
"'I shall find it, I shall find it,' cried Allurid de Ashby. "'Good night, and thanks, Sir Guy. We shall meet again to-morrow.' With this short adieu, he took his way forward, and in his quick, impetuous haste had well-nigh passed the house which he was seeking. But the boy pulled him by the sleeve, saying, "'This must be it, my lord,' and looking round, he plunged into the dark retreating nook in which it stood, and feeling for the door, struck sharply upon it with the hilt of his dagger. For near a minute there was no sound, and the young earl was about to knock again, when a light, shining through the chinks, showed him that somebody was coming. He drew back a step, and a moment after the door was opened with a slow and deliberate hand, which suited ill with the young nobleman's impatient mood. The sight that he beheld, however, when his eyes recovered from the first glare of the light, struck him with surprise, and calmed him also, for the effect of gentler feelings than those which had lately agitated his bosom. It was the form of fair Kate Greenlee that presented itself. It was her face that the rays of the lamp shone upon. But, oh, what a change had been wrought in that face, even within the last three days! Still more terrible was the alteration since the Earl had last seen it, when he jested for a moment with his cousin's leman some months before in Hereford. Then it had been bright and blooming, full of life and eagerness, with much of the loveliness which then characterised it, depending upon youth and high health. Now, though beauty still lingered, and the fine line of the features could not be altered, yet the face was sharp and pale and worn, the lips bloodless, and the bright, dark eyes, though shining, with almost preternatural lustre, had a fixed, stern look, no longer wild and sparkling, but full of intense thought and strong, yet painful purpose. The form, too, seemed shrunk and changed. The grace, indeed, remained, but the rounded contour of the limbs was withered and gone. "'Why, Kate!' exclaimed the girl. "'Why, how now? What is this? You seem ill.' "'I seem what I am, my lord,' replied Kate Greenly. "'I am glad you are come. Your presence is much wanted.' "'Where?' demanded the earl. "'What do you mean, my poor girl? Some new mishap, I warrant you? "'Where is my presence wanted, Kate?' "'I will show you, my lord,' replied Kate Greenly, "'if you will follow me.' And she led the way up the stairs. At the end of the first flight the earl paused, saying, "'Is not Dickon here, that he comes not forth?' Kate gave him no direct answer, merely replying, "'This way, my lord, this way, sir.' "'He must be ill,' thought the earl, "'and she, too, is ill, that is clear. "'Tis some fever belike. "'I have heard there is one in Nottingham.' At the top of the next flight the girl laid her hand upon the latch of a rough door, formed of unsmoothed wood, holding the lamp so as to give the earl light in his ascent. The moment after she opened the door and entered, leading the way towards the foot of a small bed, by which was burning a waxen paper. The earl followed, murmuring, "'This is a poor place,' but raised his eyes as he approached the foot of the bed, and, to his surprise, beheld the ghastly face of a dead man, stretched out, with a sprig of holly resting on his breast. "'Good heaven!' he exclaimed. "'Who is this?' "'The murderer of your father.' "'replied Kate Greenly, without adding a word more. "'Allured de Ashby clasped his hands with deep and terrible emotion. "'His mind at the moment paused not to inquire whether the tale were true or false, "'but flashing at once through his heart and brain came the feeling of wrath, "'even at the inanimate mass before him, "'for the deed that had been done, mingled with grief and anxiety at having charged it upon another, "'and the memory of all the embarrassments which that charge must produce.' "'The murder of my father?' he said. "'The murder of my father? Is that the murderer of my father? "'Then Mothama is innocent.' "'As innocent as yourself,' replied Kate greenly. "'This is one of those who did the deed, but there were more than one. "'Huda Mothama, however, was many a mile away, "'and there lies the man who struck the first blow. "'Look here.' she cried, and partly drawing down the sheet, she pointed to the wound upon the dead man's breast, saying, "'There entered your father's sword, for the old man died gallantly, and sent one at least to his account.' "'Aye, I remember,' replied the earl thoughtfully. "'They found his sword naked and bloody. But how is this?' he continued, turning towards Kate and gazing on her face. "'You seem to know it all, as if you had been present. 
"'Now I perceive what makes you haggard and pale.' "'Tis seeing such sights as this,' replied Kate Greenly. "'Ay, and many another sad cause besides. "'But you ask how I know all this. "'I will tell you, Earl of Ashby, "'by taking down from that man's own lips in his dying moments "'the confession of his crime. "'The priest adjured him to make full avowal of the truth, "'not only to the ear of the confessor, "'which could but benefit his own soul.' but for the ear of justice, that the innocent might not be punished for the guilty. Such confession as he did make, I myself wrote down. He signed it with his dying hand, and I and Father Mark were the witnesses thereunto. Here is the paper. Read and satisfy yourself. The priest I have sent for, he will soon be here. Alured de Ashby took the paper, and, by the light of the lamp held by Kate Greenley, read the few words that it contained. I do publicly acknowledge and confess, so ran the writing, which followed exactly the broken words of the dying man, that I, Ingleram Dighton, did on the afternoon of Tuesday last, together with three others, no, I will not mention their names, who had come down with me the day before from the good city of London, lay in wait for the Earl of Ashby at a place called the Bull's Hawthorn. I struck him first, but only wounded him, whereupon he drew his sword and plunged it into my side, from which I am now dying. The Lord have mercy upon my soul. El, but no, I will not mention his name. Another man stabbed him behind, and we threw him into the pit. The Lord Hugh de Mothama had nothing to do with the deed. We used his name because the person that set us on wanted the charge to fall on him, and a letter was written, as if from him, asking the old earl to see him alone at the place of the murder but he never wrote it or knew of it i have never seen him or spoken to him in my life but only heard that morning that he had escaped from prison this has been read over to me now dying at the house of sir richard de ashby and i swear by the holy sacrament and all the saints that it is true so help me god it was signed with a shaking hand Ingleram Dighton, and below were the names of Kate Greenley and the priest as witnesses. The young earl read and re-read it, and then looking upon his companion somewhat sternly, he asked, "'Why did you not produce this before?' "'For many reasons,' replied Kate Greenley calmly. First, because I had not the means. Do you suppose that the cruel and deceitful villain into whose power I have fallen leaves me to roam whither I please?' "'Tis but when he is absent that I dare quit the house. "'In the next place, you were at Lindwell, "'and in the next I wished, ere I brought forward even so much as this, "'to have the whole in my hands, "'to be able not only to say, "'This man is innocent, but also, "'That man is guilty. "'I tell you, Earl, I would not now have told you what I have, "'but that you must not risk your own life in a false quarrel, "'nor bring upon yourself the guilt of slaying another "'for deeds that he did not commit.' Knowing as much as you do now know, it is your task and duty to sift this matter to the bottom, and to discover the instigator of this murder, for he who now lies there, and his companions, were but tools. I am ready and willing to speak all I know, when the time and place is fitting, yet you must be neither too quick nor too slow. If you are too slow, I shall not be here. My days are numbered, and are flying fast, and if you are hasty, the guilty one will escape you. "'And who is the guilty one?' demanded Alurid to Ashby, bending his brows sternly upon her. "'Who is the guilty one? Name him, girl, I adjure thee. Name him. Name him, if ever thou hast had the feelings of a child towards a father.' Kate gave a low cry, as if from corporeal pain, and then, shaking her head mournfully, she said, "'I have had the feelings of a child towards a father, Earl of Ashby.' and for the sake of your false cousin i tore those feelings from my heart in spite of all the agony for his sake i brought disgrace upon my father's house for his sake i strewed ashes upon a parent's head for his sake i poured coals of fire upon my own and how has he repaid me but you ask me who is the man i will not be his accuser till all other means fail i will not be accuser and witness too you have the clue in your hands Use it wisely and firmly, and you will soon discover all you seek to know. The earl gazed in her face for a minute, 
with a keen and searching glance, then turned his look once more upon the corpse, took a step or two nearer, and examined the features attentively. "'Give me the lamp,' he said, and taking it from her hand, he bent down his own head, and seemed to scan every lineament, as if to fix them in his mind for ever. But his thoughts were, in reality, turning to the past, not the future, and raising himself to his full height again, he added aloud, "'I have seen that face before, though where I cannot tell. The memory will return, however. How came he here? Who brought him here to die?' "'Those who took him hence to slay,' answered Kate greenly. "'Didst thou ever see him before that day?' demanded the earl. "'Twice,' was the reply. "'Hark! There is the curfew!' exclaimed the earl. "'I must away.' "'Stay till the priest comes,' cried Kate eagerly. "'He will be here ere long.' "'I cannot,' answered Alurid de Ashby. "'I am expected at the castle even now. "'But fear not that I will forget this business.' I will find out the truth, even if I have to cut it from the hearts of those that would conceal it, and I will be calm, too, tranquil and calm and cautious. Go, then, said Kate. You tell me. But no, you will not dream of it. You have no thought of meeting in arms an innocent and blameless man upon a false and unholy charge. Promise me. Promise me. I will make no promise, answered the earl. You seem to feel some deep interest in this Mothama. "'I never saw his face but twice,' replied Kate solemnly. "'I never heard his voice but once. "'I have no interest in him, but weak and fallen and disgraced as I am. "'I have still an interest in right and truth. "'Neither would I see you fall before his lance, "'for fall assuredly you will, if you go forth to meet him. "'Nay, look not proud, Earl of Ashby, before a dying girl, "'who knows naught of these haughty strifes.' and I can little tell whether you or he, if all were equal, would bear away the prize of chivalry. But I say, all is not equal between you, and if you meet Hugh de Mothama, you fall before his lance as sure as you now live. For he is armoured in high innocence, with a just quarrel, and an honest name to vindicate. You fight, weighed down with a consciousness of wrong upon your arm, a false oath upon your lips, and doubt and discouragement at your heart. Were you twenty times the night you are, that burden were enough to make you fall before a peasant's staff. One thing, however, I have a right to demand. You shall give that paper to Prince Edward fully twelve hours before you go into the lists. This you must promise me to do, or I myself will go and cast myself— I have no right to refuse, interrupted the earl. On my honour, as a knight, the prince shall have the paper— "'Be you ready to prove that it is genuine?' "'I am ever ready,' answered Kate, "'and though I may shrink and quiver like a wounded limb "'when the surgeon draws the arrow forth, "'yet I shall be glad when each step of my bitter task is begun "'and the time of rest comes nearer. "'If they wish to remove his body,' "'she added as the earl walked towards the door. "'Let them do it,' answered Allured. "'Let them do it. They shall be watched.' Thus saying, he left the room and slowly descended the stairs, Kate Greenly lighting him down to the bottom. He went thoughtfully and sadly, with a heart full of gloom, anxiety, and strife, but there were kindly parts in his character too, and when he reached the bottom step he turned and looked once more in the face of his unhappy companion. Then, taking her hand, he said, "'Poor girl, I am sorry for thee. Can naught be done to save thee?' "'Nothing, my lord,' replied Kate Greenly calmly. "'I have but one saviour, and he is not of earth.'" End of chapter 38「Thirty Nine of Forest Days by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 39 the king has sat down to supper my good lord said one of the young earl's attendants meeting him at the door of his apartments and wondered that you were not there a seat is kept for you however is it near the prince demanded alured nay my lord the prince is gone replied the man did you not know it gone exclaimed the young nobleman gone whither to leicester my lord said the servant while you and sir guy de margham were conversing here News came from Leicester of a revolt amongst the peasants there, and the prince set out at once with some fifty men. Tis not half an hour since. 
"'Why, he is to be the judge of the field the day after tomorrow," cried the Earl, in surprise and evident disappointment. "'I heard him tell the King myself, my lord,' replied the man, "'that he would be back ere sunset tomorrow.' "'This is unfortunate,' murmured Allured. "'This is most unfortunate. "'But it can't be helped. "'And after making some slight change in his apparel "'and giving some orders in a low but earnest voice, "'he hastened to the hall. "'Henry, as soon as he appeared, "'greeted him with light merriment, saying, "'You are late for the banquet, noble earl, "'but we forgive you, as we doubt not "'some fair lady held you in chains of dalliance "'not to be broken.' "'Nay, sire,' replied the earl gravely, "'my heart is too full of other things to think of levities. "'I was with a sick friend, and the time, though it passed heavily, was not noted.' "'A sick friend is as good an excuse as a fair lady,' said the king, "'and one that may be pleaded at all times.' "'Nay, sire,' replied Mortimer, who was sitting near, Neither fair lady nor sick friend can be a moment's excuse for delay in day of battle, or even, I hold, of tournament. A high question of chivalry, replied the king. Let some of our old knights decide it. What say you, Sir John Hardy? That the matter has been decided often, my liege, said the old soldier, who was placed some way down the table, and who spoke with grave deliberation on the subject which he considered all-important. "'No excuse on earth can be received for the man who has touched a challenger's shield, "'or taken an accuser's glove, or received his leader's command to prepare for battle, "'if he be more than a quarter of an hour behind the time appointed. "'That space is given in case of accident or men's judgment differing as to time. "'Thus the trumpets may sound thrice with five minutes between each blast, "'but if he comes not at the third call, he is held coward and recreant by all civilised men.' "'and can plead nothing unless it be the commands of his sovereign as an excuse. "'The honour of a knight,' said another old soldier, "'in an authoritative and somewhat pedantic tone, "'should be as bright as his shield, "'as clear and cutting as his sword, "'and as pointed and steady as his lance. "'What he has once asserted, "'that he should maintain to the death, "'for whatever cause there may be for retracting, an imputation on his courage will still lie, if he make a moment's delay in meeting an enemy in the field. Hugh de Mothimer remained calm and pale, but the cheek of Alurid de Ashby flushed as if every word he heard was fire. As soon as possible after the banquet he quitted the hall and sought his apartments with a hurried and irregular step. He found the armourers still busy in their task as he passed through the outer chamber, and pausing at the bench where they were working, he gazed down upon the weapons under their hands with a thoughtful but abstracted look. Then, with a sudden start, clenching his hand tight, he said, "'See that all be firm and strong, Mapleton, yet not too heavy.' "'Fear not, my lord, fear not,' replied the armourer. "'There never was better steel in all the world, and these poilins are a rare invention for the defence of the elbows and knees.' "'I have prepared a garland, too, my lord, for your neck. "'I know you love it not, but tis much safer, if you will but wear it, "'though it does spoil the look of the hauberk. "'It must be confessed. "'But very often I have known the blow of a lance right in the throat "'kill or disable a knight, though the spear went not through the rings. "'Tis a trick with the Lord Hugh, too, I hear, to aim at the throat. "'They say he killed two men so at Evesham, "'and the soldan of Egypt's brother when he was in pain Imri. "'Alured de Ashby had long ceased to listen, "'but with his brow bent and his eyes fixed upon the arms, "'he stood thinking of other things, "'till the armourer ceased and looked up in his face, "'and then, turning away, he quitted the room without any reply. "'When in his own chamber he closed the door, "'and for nearly two hours his foot might be heard walking to and fro, "'sometimes, indeed, pausing for a minute or two, "'but still resuming its heavy tread. "'Who can depict all the stormy passions "'that agitated him at that moment, "'the struggle that was taking place in his bosom, "'so different from that which had torn the heart of Hugh de Mothimer, "'though as violent in its degree, "'and proceeding from the same events? "'To fight in an unrighteous quarrel, "'to go solemnly appealing to heaven "'for the justice of his cause,' 
and to feel that that cause was unjust deliberately to persist in charging an innocent man with a horrible crime of which he knew him to be innocent it was a fearful contemplation for one in whom conscience had not been smothered under many evil deeds notwithstanding the faults and follies which sometimes blinded his eyes to right and wrong but yet to retract the accusation he had made to acknowledge that he had erred to own that he had been rash and weak to see hugh de mothama triumph all this was repugnant to the most powerful vices of his character to jealous pride and irritable vanity nevertheless this he might have overcome for as we have shown there was a high sense of honour in his nature and the voice of conscience was strong enough when the question was one of such mighty moment to overpower the busy tongue of passion and lead him to what was right but alas there was another consideration he feared the loss of renown the very suspicion of any dread of his adversary was enough to put every good resolution to flight and unhappily the laws of chivalry opposed a barrier to his pursuing the only course of rectitude which would have been difficult enough to surmount even had his natural disposition been different from what it was then came back the remembrance of the conversation which had taken place at the banquet it seemed to him as if the two old knights who had declared the rules of arms had been sitting in judgment on the cause pleaded by the disputants in his own bosom they had pronounced against the voice of conscience they had given sentence in favour of that fantastic honour which was based more on personal courage than on truth good heaven he thought that the world should suspect he was afraid to meet in arms the man he had accused that he should fear hugh de mothama that he should take advantage of any new risen doubt to withdraw a charge which he had solemnly made and shrink from a combat which he had himself provoked how would men jeer at his name how silent would the herald stand when he entered the court or the tilt-yard he pictured to himself a thousand imaginary insults he saw knights refusing to break a lance with one who had shrunk from the wager of battle he had demanded he saw ladies turning away their heads in scorn from the craven knight who had feared to meet an equal in the field he could not he would not do it and yet conscience still cried aloud ay and the voice of kate greenley rang in his ears telling him that conscience was powerful to overthrow as well as to admonish prophesying to him that he would fall before the lance of the man he knowingly injured and that shame and defeat as well as injustice and falsehood would be his companions on that fatal field foul befall the girl he cried for putting such thoughts into my head they hang upon me like a spell they will cling to me in the hour of battle many a man has fought in an unjust cause i am many a one has fallen in this ordeal is the judgment of god shown or is it not is it possible to conceive that we can appeal to him and call upon him to defend the right and solemnly swear that our cause is just all the time having a lie upon our lips and that he will not punish he will worsen the god of the mussulma if he did not what then shall i gain for the first time in life i shall soil my soul with an untruth i shall take a false oath i shall be defeated disgraced with the judgment of god pronouncing that i am perjured and die leaving a stained and blackened name behind and yet to withdraw the charge is impossible he continued better disgrace and hide me from contumely in the grave than live and meet the scornful looks of every knight in europe my only chance is in the prince perhaps he may stop it would he were here i would give him the paper now yet i must show no desire to recant the accusation i remember how his proud lip curled when that braggart de poix slunk from the melee at the northampton tournament on pretence that his horse was lame curses on my own precipitate haste but still deeper curses on that traitor richard who urged me on would i could know the truth oh if i thought that it was so i would tear his heart from his body and trample it quivering in the dust the foul villain 
and my father so good to him. Such were some of the broken and disjointed thoughts which crossed the mind of Alured de Ashby, and from them the reader may form some idea of the agitated state of his feelings during that night. He slept scarcely at all till morning, but he then fell into a deep slumber which lasted several hours, and from which he rose refreshed and calmer, but nevertheless stern and sad. He was restless, too, in the hesitating and undecided state of his mind on the most pressing subject before him, rendered him wavering in all his actions. In the morning several of his servants, who had been out all night, according to orders he had given them, came in to make their report, and informed him that though they had watched steadily at the spot which he had pointed out, no one had come out of the house but a priest and a little boy bearing a torch. He then sent for some of the old retainers of the family, who had been at Lindwell when his father was slain, and on their arrival questioned them minutely on many points, and then he told his people that he was going to the apartments of his sister. But when he came to the foot of the stairs, he paused, turned back again, and strode up and down the court for half an hour. His next proceeding was to order his horses instantly, and he set out on the road to Leicester. When he was about halfway there, however, he turned his charger's head and reached the gates of Nottingham just as night was falling. The city warder told him, in answer to his questions, that the prince had not returned, but that a messenger from him had arrived an hour before, and it was rumoured that Edward would not be back until the following morning. The earl shook the bridle of his horse fiercely and galloped up to the castle. Before he reached it, however, the fit of angry impatience had passed away, and on dismounting he proceeded direct to the apartments of the prince, and sent in a page to say he wished to see the lady Lucy. He was instantly admitted to her chamber, where the sight of her fair face, bearing evident marks of tears, and full of deep and inconsolable sorrow, shook his purposes again, and added to all the bitterness of his feelings. Alured kissed her tenderly, but he perceived that though she uttered not a word of reproach, she shrunk from him, and that was reproach enough. At his desire she sent away her maids, and then, sitting down beside her, he took her hand in his, saying, "'Lucy, I have come to see you, perhaps for the last time.' She cast down her eyes and made no reply, and he went on, "'It is not fit, Lucy, that you and I should part with one cold feeling between us, and I come to ask forgiveness for any pain that I have caused you throughout life.' "'Oh, Alured! exclaimed Lucy, "'the last and most dreadful pain may yet be avoided. "'But I know your stern and unchangeable heart too well to hope. "'You cannot but feel how horrible it is to see my brother and my promised husband "'armed against each other's life, "'meeting in lists from which one or the other must be born a corpse. "'You cannot but know, Alured, that to me the misery is the same, "'whichever is the victor.' that I have nothing to hope, that I have nothing to look for. If you de Muthama is vanquished, my brother is the murderer of him I love. Ay, murderer, Alurid, she added solemnly, for you are well aware that in your heart you believe him innocent. If you fall before you de Muthama's lance, the man I love becomes a butcher of my brother, and I can never see his face again. Stay, Lucy, stay, said the earl. It is on this account that I have come to you, I have had much and bitter thought, Lucy. Hugh de Muthama may be innocent. God only knows the heart of man, and he will decide. But if I die in the lists to-morrow, and he you love is proved to be innocent of my father's death, let my blood rest upon my own head, hold him guiltless of my fate, and wed him as if Alured de Ashby had not been. Oh, Alured, cried Lucy, touched to the heart, "'casting her arms around him at the same time "'and weeping on his bosom. "'No, no, that can never be. "'Yes, but it must and shall be,' replied her brother. "'I will not do you wrong, Lucy, in my dying hour. "'Here, I have put down in a few brief words "'my resolution and my wishes. "'Read, Lucy. "'What, your eyes are dim with tears? "'Well, I will read it.' I, Alured de Ashby, 
about to do battle with the Lord Hugh de Mothma, to whom the hand of my sister Lucy was promised by my father before his decease, having lately had some cause to doubt the truth of the charge which I have brought against the said Lord, of having compassed the death of my father, do hereby give my consent to the marriage of my sister with the said Hugh de Mothma, if at any time he can prove fully and clearly that he is innocent of the deed. And I do beseech my sister, entreat and require her in that case, to give her hand to Hugh de Mothma, whatever may have taken place between him and myself. There, girl, keep that paper and use it when thou wilt. Now, art thou contented? Contented, Alured? cried Lucy, look, looking reproachfully in his face. Contented? Do you think I can be contented to know that either he or you must die? What you take from one scale you cast into the other. If my heart can be lightened respecting him by this generous act, how much more heavy the grief and terror that I feel for you. Oh, Alured, you say that you now doubt his guilt? Why not boldly and at once express that doubt? Why not? My honour, child, my honour and renown, cried Alured to Ashby. But you will unman me, Lucy. Here, give this sealed packet to the prince whenever he returns. Perhaps he has returned, said Lucy. The princess told me he would be back ere nightfall. He has changed his purpose, replied her brother, and will not be in Nottingham till tomorrow. Alas, alas, exclaimed Lucy, that is unfortunate. It cannot be helped, answered the young earl, but give it to the prince whenever he comes. Tell him that therein are contained the proofs which have lately made me doubt the justice of my charge against Mothama. He must act as he thinks fit regarding them. But remember, Lucy, that if I fall and you become Mothama's wife, he takes the retribution of blood upon him, and must pursue the murderers of our father till he approve their guilt upon them, and give them up to death. And now, girl, fare thee well. Nay, Alured, she cried, clinging to him, listen to me yet one word. If you be so doubtful, can you swear— Hush, hush, he answered. My mind is now made up beyond all alteration. I will do everything to clear me before God, and make my conscience easy. But I must never shrink from battle. I must never sully my renown. I must never bear the name of coward, or know that one man suspects I am such. Farewell, Lucy, farewell, not one word more. And kissing her tenderly, she unclasped the clinging arms that would have held him, and left her chamber. For a moment Lucy covered her eyes and wept, but the next instant, clasping her hands together, she cried, I will go to Hugh, and will beseech him. He is more tender, he has more trust in his own great renown. The victor at Demietta, the conqueror of the lists at Sidon, need fear no injurious suspicion. I will go to him. I will entreat him on my knees. But first to the princess with this packet. She must give it to her husband. What does it contain, I wonder? Lucy gazed at it for a moment, and then at the other paper which her brother had given her. Suddenly a light like that of joy broke upon her face, and she exclaimed, he will he will why should i fear why should i doubt he told me himself that in seven days he could prove his innocence he will he will and with this before me i need fear no shame but now to the princess and with a quick step she hurried to the apartments of eleanor whom for once she found alone she was too deeply agitated for courtly ceremony, and gliding in she approached the princess as she sat reading, and knelt on the cushion at her feet. "'What is it, my poor Lucy?' said the princess, bending down her head and kissing her fair forehead, with a look of tender compassion. "'There seems some happiness mingled with the sorrow of your look.' "'Tis that I have hope,' replied Lucy, and with a rapid but low word she related all that had passed between her brother and herself. She then put the packet into Eleanor's hands, saying, "'It will prove his innocence, I am sure, but the prince is absent, and I am afraid you will not open it.' "'Nay,' answered Eleanor, "'I must not venture on such an act as that. I am only bold where it is to show my love for him, but not to meddle in matters of which he alone can judge. 
Neither is there occasion here, my Lucy. He will be back ere long. But Hilliard thought not, replied her fair companion. He had heard that the prince's journey from Leicester was put off till tomorrow morning. Not so, not so, replied the princess. "'Twas but delayed for an hour or two, and he sent, lest I should fear the rebels had detained him. I expect him each minute, Lucy, but in the meantime tell me more clearly what caused that look of joy just now. Lucy hesitated. "'Twas that a hope had crossed my mind,' she said, a hope that I might yet save them both. And surely, lady, she continued, raising her soft dark eyes to Eleanor's face, and surely to save both the life of a brother and a lover, to spare them deeds that can never be atoned, to shield Alurid not only from Mothamus Lance, but from the more terrible fate of going to his god with a false charge upon his lips, a charge which he knows to be false. A woman may well put on a boldness she would otherwise shrink from, ay, and do things which maiden modesty would forbid, and not the cause so great and overpowering. Certainly, rejoined Eleanor, so long as virtue and religion say not nay. God forbid that I should sin against either, replied Lucy eagerly. That could never be, lady, but there be small forms and prudent cautions, reserves, and cold proprieties, which, in the ordinary intercourse of life, are near akin to virtues, though separate. These surely must be laid aside. When the matter is to rescue from crime, from death, or from disgrace, being so much beloved as these. Assuredly, exclaimed Eleanor, who can doubt it? To save my Edward, what should stand in my way? Nothing but that honour which I know he values more than all earthly things, or even life itself. Thanks, lady, thanks, cried Lucy. You confirm me in my purpose. But what is your purpose, my sweet cousin? asked the princess. I do not yet comprehend you. "'Will you promise me,' said Lucy, "'that if I tell you, you will let me have my will, "'that you will put no bar or hindrance in my way, "'nor inform any one of my scheme, but with my leave?' "'Eleanor smiled. "'I may well promise that,' she answered, "'for if you please, you may conceal your scheme, "'and then I am powerless. "'No bar or hindrance will I place, dear Lucy, "'but kind remonstrances, if I think you wrong. "'What is this plan of yours?' "'This, this!' cried Lucy. "'Here on this paper has my brother written down "'that he doubts Hugh de Mothamus' guilt, "'that he so much doubts the truth of the charge "'which he himself has made "'as to require his sister to overlook the shedding of his blood "'and unite her fate with the man who slays him, "'if he should fall in those fatal lists. "'Nay, lady, look you here. "'He puts no condition, but that Hugh de Mothamus "'should prove his innocence.' Well, said Eleanor, I see he is kind and generous, and evidently believes the charge was rashly made, and is not just. Yet naught will keep him, replied Lucy, from sustaining that charge to-morrow at the lance's point, although he knows it to be false. Tears, prayers, entreaties, appeals to conscience and to honour are all in vain with him. He will die, but yield no jot of what he thinks his fame requires." He would not withdraw the accusation if an angel told him it were untrue. But Hugh is not so stern and cruel, lady. He will listen to reason and to right. He told me himself that he would have laid down his battle hand, would but the king have named a few days later. For he is as sure as of his own life to prove the guilt upon another man. O oh, lady, in that long, sad interview, he was as much shaken as I, a poor, weak girl. Yet what could I say, what could I do, so long as my brother maintained the charge in all its virulence? Now, however, now I will hie to him, I, lady, she continued, even to his chamber. I will beseech him for mercy's sake, for my sake, for our love's sake, to avoid this unholy counter, for the peace, for the comfort throughout life of the lady that he loves, to quit this place ere morning's dawn to-morrow. "'He will not do it,' answered Eleanor sadly. "'You will but wring his heart and break your own. "'He will not do it.' "'I will soften him with my tears,' said Lucy vehemently. "'I will kneel to him on the ground. "'I will cover his hand with my kisses "'and water it with my eyes.' "'Eleanor shook her head. 
"'I will offer to go with him,' said Lucy in a low and thrilling tone, "'fixing her eyes with a look of doubt and inquiry on the princess's face. "'Ha!' cried her Eleanor, starting, while for a moment the colour mounted into her cheek. "'But the next instant she cast her arms round Lucy and bent her head towards her with a smile, saying, "'And thou wilt conquer. Dear, devoted girl, I dare not altogether approve and sanction what you do.' "'Yet I will add, hard were the heart, and discourteous were the lip, to blame thee. "'The object is a mighty one. No common means will reach it, "'and surely, if thou dost succeed in saving thy brother both from a great crime and a great danger, "'and proving thy lover innocent without risking his renown, "'thou shalt deserve high praise and honour and no censure, "'even in this foul-tongued world in which we live. "'But stay yet a while.' "'Edward will soon be here, and perchance this letter itself may render the trial needless. "'You say that it contains proof of your lover's innocence?' "'So my brother told me,' replied Lucy, "'proofs that I have shaken even his stern spirit. "'But, lady, you must not betray my secret to the prince, for he will stop our departure.' "'If I tell him,' answered Eleanor, "'my promise shall bind both.' but doubtless the king, if there be any clear proofs here in these papers, will order the wager of battle to be delayed. But go, get thee ready for thy task, dear Lucy. When Edward comes, I will send for thee again. End of chapter 39《Chapter 40 of Forest Days by G. P. R. James this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 40 About an hour before the return of the young Earl of Ashby from his ride towards Leicester, his cousin Richard had presented himself in his antechamber, expecting to find him within. He was no favourite of the servants of the house, and a feeling of doubt and distrust towards him had become general amongst them. A cold look from the armourers and a saucy reply from a page importing that the earl was absent and that no one could tell when he would come back was all the satisfaction which richard de ashby could obtain and returning into the court he paced slowly across towards the gate where he had left his horses sir william geary passed him just at that moment but did not stop merely saying with his cold supercilious look ha dickon thou art in the way to make a great man of thyself it seems "'Stay, Geary, stay,' cried Sir Richard, not very well pleased either with his tone or his look. But Sir William walked on, replying, "'I can't at present, Dickon, for once in my life I am busy.' "'They all look cold upon me,' muttered Richard to Ashby as he walked slowly on. "'Can anything have been discovered?' His heart sunk at the thought, and the idea of flying crossed his mind for a moment. But he was, as we have shown, not without a dogged sort of courage, and he murmured, "'No, I will die at the stake sooner. I must find out, however, what has taken place, that I may be prepared.' He somewhat quickened his pace, and had already put his foot in the stirrup to mount his horse, when he heard a voice calling him by name, and turning round with a sudden start, he beheld Guy de Margan coming after him with rapid steps. "'I saw you from my window,' said the courtier, hastening up, "'and have much matter for your ear. "'But let us go down by the back way into the town, "'and let your horses follow.' "'In a moment Richard de Ashby had banished from his countenance "'the look of anxiety and thought which he had just borne, "'not choosing that one, who was already somewhat more in his confidence than he liked, "'should see those traces of painful care "'which might perhaps lead him, joined with the knowledge he already possessed, to a suspicion of those darker deeds which had not been communicated to him. "'Well, Guy,' he said as they walked on, "'how flies the crow now? I find my noble cousin, the Earl, has gone out to take an afternoon ride. Not the way, methinks, that men usually spend the last few hours before a mortal encounter, but he does it for bravado, and, if he do not mind, his life and his renown will end together in tomorrow's field.' "'Perhaps to a better they did,' answered Guy de Margan shortly, and then, replying to a look of affected wonder which Richard Ashby turned upon him, he continued, "'I know not your plans or secrets, Dickon, but I fear you will find your cousin Allured less easy to deal with than even Hugh de Mothimer. 
"'He doubts the truth of the charge he has brought.' "'Then he should not have brought it,' said Richard to Ashby. "'What have I to do with that?' "'Nothing, perhaps,' replied Guy de Margan. "'But he loves not any of those whose reports induced him to make it. "'I found that myself while I was sitting with him last night. "'He was strangely uncivil to me. "'But you are foremost on the list, Dickon.' "'Pooh!' cried the other. "'Let him but conquer in tomorrow's lists, "'and the pride of having done so will make him love us all dearly again.' "'I know Alured well, de Margan, and there is no harm done, if that be all.' "'But it is not all,' said Guy de Margan. "'While I was sitting with him, an old woman, a withered old woman, the servants told me after, "'came up to call him to your house, bearing a message, as if from you. "'Twas false, I was far away. Did he go?' exclaimed Richard de Ashby, now moved indeed. "'That did he, immediately,' answered his companion. "'I walked down with him and saw him.' "'Why, in the name of hell, did you not stop him?' cried Richard to Ashby. "'Old woman, I have no old woman there.' "'Perhaps he went to see the young one you have there,' said Guy de Margan in a careless tone. "'Curse her, if she have!' exclaimed Richard to Ashby, and then suddenly stopped himself without finishing his sentence. "'Yes,' proceeded Guy de Margan with the same affected indifference of tone, "'Yes, he did go down, and went in, and stayed more than an hour, "'for I was at the king's banquet and saw him come back, "'and spoke with his henchman, Peter, afterwards, "'who told me that he was mightily affected all that night, "'and brought with him, from your house, a paper, "'which he sealed carefully up. "'Look to it, Dickon, look to it.' "'They had now come to a flight of steps "'which led them down over one of the rocky descents "'which were then somewhat more steep, than they are now in the good town of Nottingham, and Richard de Ashby, pausing at the top, ordered the horses to go round, while he, with Guy de Margan, took the shorter way. He said nothing till he reached the bottom, but there, between two houses, neither of which had any windows on that side, he stopped suddenly, and grasping his companion's arm, regarded him face to face with a bent brow and searching eye. "'What is it you mean, Guy de Margan?' he answered. You either know or suspect something more than you say. I know nothing, replied Guy de Margan, and I wish to know nothing, my good friend, so tell me nothing. I am the least curious man in all the world. What I suspect is another affair. But now listen to me. The death of Hugh de Mothama, sweet gentleman though he be, would not be unpleasant to me. The death of the earl, though you would have to wear mourning for your earldom, would not, I have reason to believe, be very inconvenient or unpleasant to you. Now mark me, Dickon, if these two men meet to-morrow, your cousin Alured, doubting the justice of his cause, and shaken by foolish scruples, will fall before the lance of Hugh de Mothama, as sure as I live. Every one of the court sees it, and knows it. That would suit your purpose well, you think but you might be mistaken even there. Nothing but dire necessity will drive Mothama to take the earl's life. The prince is to be the judge of the field, and he will drop his warder on the very slightest excuse. Thus you may be frustrated, and both you and I see our hopes marred in a minute. But there is something more to be said. I do not choose that your purpose should be served and not my own. "'Why, Guy de Margan,' exclaimed his companion in a bitter tone, "'You do not think that I am tenderly anxious for Mothama's life?' "'No, nor I for Alurid de Ashby's,' answered de Margan. "'But either both shall die, or both shall live, Richard de Ashby. "'Your cousin's mind is now in that state, "'that but three words from me, turning his suspicions in another channel, "'will make him retract his charge and offer amends to him he has calumniated. "'Ay, and worse may come of it than that.' Now I will speak these words, Richard de Ashby, in plain terms. I will prevent this conflict, unless you assure me that both shall fall. But how can I do that? demanded Richard de Ashby, gazing upon him with evident alarm. How is it possible for me to ensure an event which is in the hand of fate alone? In the hand of fate, cried Guy de Margan with a scoff. To hear thee speak, one would think that thou art as innocent as nose dove. Art thou not thy cousin's godfather in the list to-morrow? Ah, so he said, replied Richard de Ashby. 
than instruct him how to slay his adversary, rejoined Guy de Morgan. Tell him not to aim at shield or helmet, but at any spot, his shoulder, his arm, his throat, his hip, where he can see the bare hauberk. Alured knows better, said Richard. He will drive straight upon him with his lance, and then the toughest wood, the firmest seat, the steadiest hand, the keenest eye will give the victory. "'Nay, but tell him,' answered Guy de Margan in a lower tone, "'that you know what is passing in his mind, the doubts, the hesitation, "'and that the conflict on foot is that wherein alone he can hope to win the day. "'Ask him if he ever saw Hugh de Mothama unhorsed by a straightforward stroke of a lance, "'whoever was his opponent, but show him that by striking him at the side and turning him in the saddle, "'he may be brought to the ground without a doubt.' "'But still, what is this to me?' asked Richard impatiently. "'The one or the other must win the day.' "'No, no,' cried Guy de Morgan. "'I will show you a means by which, if you can ensure that Alurid de Ashby's lance dips but its point in Hugh de Mothama's blood, "'it shall carry with it as certain a death as if it went through and through his heart. "'A scratch, a simple scratch will do it. "'When I was in the land of the old Romans, now filled with priests and sluggards, who have naught on earth to do but to sit and debauch the peasant girls and hatch means of ridding themselves of enemies a good honest man who took care that none should be long his foe and was possessed of many excellent secrets gave me for weighty considerations a powder of so balmy a quality that either dropped into a cup or rubbed on a fresh wound though the quantity be not bigger than will lie on a pin's head it will cure the most miserable man of all his sorrows or within half an hour will take out the pain of the most terrible injury for ever i understand i understand said richard de ashby give me the powder would i had had it long ago but how can one fix it to the lance's point so that in the shock of combat it is not brushed off mix it with some gentle unguent answered guy de margan twill have the same effect i will i will replied his companion then with a thick glove i will feel the lance's point to make sure that all is right like a good cautious godfather in arms first carefully trying the wood upon my knee with every other seeming caution which the experienced in such matters use no fear but alurid one way or the other will draw his blood oh yes and both shall go on the same road half an hour say you will he have strength to end the combat fully replied guy de Margo for within two minutes of his death he will seem as strong as ever i tried it on a hound just scratched his hanging lip then took him to the field and on he went after the game eager and strong and loud-tongued but in full cry down dropped he in a moment quivering and panting and after beating the air for some two minutes with his struggling paws lay dead give it me give it me cried richard to ashby and then burst into a fit of laughter as if it were the merriest joke that ever had been told guy de margan put his hand into the small embroidered pouch he wore under his arm and took forth an ivory box not bigger than a large piece of money what is this all exclaimed richard ashby taking the little case is this enough to slay more men than fell at evesham replied guy de margan but be careful how you mix it remember the slightest scratch upon your own hand sends you to the place appointed for you if but a grain of that finds entrance i will take care i will take care said richard to ashby and now look upon the deed as done ere this time to-morrow you will have had your revenge and i shall be earl of ashby ha <laughs> ha cried guy de margan is the truth out at length well good richard fare thee well we shall meet to-morrow in deep grief for the events of this sad field in the meantime i will go to your cousin the short-lived earl and nerve him for his battle i will inform him with mysterious looks that there is a plot afoot to delay the combat and to make him believe his adversary innocent you harp on the same string when you see him and i will tell him too that he shall have proof sufficient early to-morrow of mothama's guilt if we but get him to the field the matter's done he will not retract farewell de margan farewell said richard to ashby i will go home and make inquiries there and as he turned away he murmured 
if this powder be so potent then may be enough for you also my good friend but i shall have another to deal with first kate greenly my pretty lady you have a secret too much to carry far if you have not betrayed me already i will take care that you shall not do so now a few minutes brought him to the house he had hired in nottingham and knocking hard the door was almost instantly opened by a young lad whom he had left behind with his unhappy paramour where is the lady was the first question that the youth's master put to him in her own chamber no noble sir replied the servant she went forth some time ago gone forth exclaimed his master gone forth when i forbade her to cross the threshold i could not stay her sir rejoined the youth who had been brought up in no bad school for learning impudence as well as other vices women will gad sir and who can stop them hold thy saucy prate knave replied the knight and answer me truly who has been here since i went nobody sir replied the boy nobody but the old priest what old priest demanded his master with a bent and angry brow the old priest who was here before noble sir said the boy in a more timid tone for his lord's look frightened him he who was here the night you went to lindwell ha cried richard de ashby a priest here that night tis well for him i caught him not when was he here again twice sir replied the youth once in the morning and last night she sent me for him again and no one else asked richard de ashby no one answered the boy firmly and then added in a more doubtful tone no one that i remember boy tis a lie replied his master i see it on thy face thou knowst thou liest and as he spoke he caught him by the breast giving him a shake and making his breath come short who has been here if thou speak'st not a word thou shalt have a taste of this and he laid his hand upon his dagger no one indeed no one that i know of said the boy i may suspect and who do you suspect asked richard de ashby why noble sir last night replied the boy as i was going up the street to seek the priest i saw two gentlemen come near the house and one of them who was the noble earl your cousin i am sure went up as if to the door and i think was let in the other turned away did my cousin go in demanded richard say me but yea or nay did he go in i say i think so sir replied the youth i think so but cannot be sure there came a sudden light across the road as if the door opened but by that time i was too far up the street to see tis as de Morgan said thought the knight and striding up at once to the chamber where the corpse was laid he found the door wide open and the body fairly laid out and decked as it was called a crucifix and some sprigs of holly were on the breast a small cup of holy water stood near a lamp was burning although the sun was not yet down and everything gave plain indication that the man had not died without the succour of the church and that the corpse had been watched by other eyes besides those of poor kate greenly i have been betrayed said richard to ashby to himself i have been betrayed yet if it be but the priest there is no great harm done the secret of confession at all events is safe but where is the girl herself and what has been her communication with allured that must be known ere many hours be over perhaps i shall know it soon enough and yet what can she tell but that a wounded man died in my house brought in by people who had once visited me and that too while i was absent tis my own conscience makes me fear if ellaby would but to take himself to wales or france or anywhere but here all would be safe enough but he keeps hovering about like a moth round a candle where are the man's clothes i wonder and taking up the lamp for it was now rapidly growing dark he sought carefully about the room but neither clothes nor sword nor dagger were to be found there is a plot against me he continued tis evident enough now she may have gained more information than i think she may have overheard something a paper what paper could she have given to allured perhaps the covenant that i foolishly gave to these men he might have had it about him ellaby may have forgotten it that were damnation indeed perhaps twere better to fly while there is yet time fly no never 
to be a wandering outcast upon the face of the earth, seeking my daily sustenance at the sword's point, or else by art and cunning, when the earldom of Ashby is almost within my grasp? No, never. I will go face it at once, and woe to him that crosses me. If I could but find that girl. Hark, there is a noise below. And with a nervous start he turned to listen, and soon heard that the sounds proceeded from the servants, whom he had sent round with his horses, talking with the lad in the hall. "'I will go face it at once,' he repeated to himself. "'I will wait for him at his lodging, and soon find out what he knows. Doubtless he has kept it to his own breast. Alirid is not one to cast a stain upon his race. No, no, he will not accuse one of the name of Ashby.' Thus saying, he descended the stairs, and bidding his servants keep good watch in the house till he returned, he took his way back to the castle on foot. On reaching the apartments of his cousin, he found a number of attendants in the outer room, apparently not long returned from a journey. Some time had since passed, however, for they were eating and drinking merrily, and little did they seem disposed to interrupt their meal for their lord's poor kinsman. "'My lord is out, Sir Richard,' said one. "'He has gone to the prince's lodging.' "'Nonsense, Ned,' cried another. "'He's come back again. "'But he told Peter that he did not wish to be disturbed by any one.' "'Of course he did not thereby be me,' replied Richard to Ashby sternly. "'Go in, Ned, and tell him I am here.' "'The man obeyed sullenly enough, "'and the moment after the knight heard his cousin's voice saying in a hasty tone, "'I want not to see him. "'Tell him I am engaged.' "'going out on matters of moment. "'Yet, yeah, stay, send him in.' "'Richard de Ashby's eyes were fixed sternly upon the ground "'as he heard the bitter confirmation of his fears, "'and he muttered to himself, "'Aye, he has heard more than he should have known.' "'When the servant returned, however, "'and bade him follow to his lord's presence, "'he cleared his brow and went in with as satisfied an air "'as he could well assume.' The table was laid for supper, and his cousin was standing at the end, in the act of setting down from his hand a drinking-cup of jewelled agate, the contents of which he had half drained. "'I would not have disturbed you, Alirid, said the knight, "'but as I am to go with you to the field, it is necessary that we should talk over our arrangements.' "'I have no arrangements to make,' cried the young earl, looking at him askance, like a fiery horse half inclined to kick at the person who approaches.' "'I am going to fight, that is all. "'I have had a lance in my hand before now, and know how to use it.' "'Yes,' replied Richard de Ashby, "'and you will use it right well, and to the destruction of your adversary.' "'I am aware of that, Alurid, but still there may be things to be said between us. "'When one knows one's opponent in the lists, "'consideration and skill may be employed to baffle his particular mode of fighting, his art. "'His trick, call it what you will.' "'Now I have often seen Hugh de Mothema run a course. "'You, I think, never have but once.' "'I met him hand to hand at Evesham,' replied his cousin impatiently. "'That is enough for me. "'I want neither advice nor assistance, cousin mine. "'And more, as we are now upon the subject, "'you go not to the field with me. "'I will choose another godfather. "'Nay, no attitudes or flashing eyes, I tell thee, Dickon. "'Things have come to my knowledge which may touch your life, so make the most of the hint. "'The time is short, for as soon as the prince returns he shall be made acquainted with all the facts.' "'But, Alured, explain!' exclaimed Richard de Ashby. "'No need of explanation,' replied his cousin. "'You will hear enough of it ere long, if you wait. "'Let your conscience be your guide to stay or fly. "'At any rate, remain not here.' "'I go for a moment to shake hands with Hugh de Mothema "'ere I meet him to-morrow at the lance's point, "'and to tell him that I bear him no ill-will, "'though honour compels me to appear in arms against him. "'I would not find you here when I return, "'and let me not see your face at to-morrow's lists, "'for it would bring down a curse upon me.' "'Thus saying, he strode out of the room without waiting for a reply, "'and Richard Ashby, in a passion of the moment, "'writhed his fingers in his own hair, and tore it out by the roots. "'A curse upon him!' he cried. "'A curse upon him! "'Well, let it fall. "'Tell the prince. "'Blast his own blood. "'Stain the name of Ashby for ever. "'Bring me to the block. "'But I know better,' he continued, suddenly recovering himself. "'He shall never do that. 
and looking anxiously round the room, he drew from his pouch the small box that Guy de Margan had given him, approached the door which his cousin had left partly open, pushed it gently to, and then, returning to the table, he poured a small portion of the white powder it contained into the drinking cup of Allured de Ashby. A triumphant smile lighted up his countenance as he saw the powder disappear in the wine which still remained in the cup. "'He will drink again when he comes back,' said the villain. "'I know him. <laughs> and he must tell his story soon to Prince Edward's ear, or his tongue may fail him by chance. On oh, my life, I think he is a coward and afraid to face this Mothama. But doubt and hesitation are past with me. Kate Greenley, tis your turn now.' She is with the priest, doubtless. She is with the priest. Her tongue once silenced, and I, Earl of Ashby, who will dare to accuse me then? Or if they do, why let them? I will unfurl my banner on my castle walls, call around me the scattered party of de Montford, and set Edward at defiance, till by a soft capitulation I ensure the past from all inquiries. But now for the girl— she must see no more suns rise and thus saying he quitted the room and castle with a hasty step End of chapter forty chapter forty one of forest days by g p r james this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter forty one the earl of ashby my good lord desires to speak with you said stout Tom Blorkett, addressing Hugh de Mothama, as he sat at table, writing. "'Admit him instantly,' answered Hugh. "'Is he alone?' "'Quite alone, my lord,' replied the man, and retired. The burst of anger to which Allured de Ashby had given way, when irritated by his cousin's presence, had passed off, and he now entered the chamber of Hugh de Mothama, grave and sad, but with feelings of a high and noble kind. He turned his eye back as he passed the door towards the ante-room, where a page and some yeomen were seated, and Hugh de Mothama, divining the meaning of the glance, bade Blorkett, as he ushered the earl in, clear the outer chamber, and let no one remain there. The earl advanced at once towards his adversary, and, with a frank though grave air, held out his hand. Hugh took it, and pressed it in his own, and seating themselves together, Allured to Ashby began upon the motive of his coming. Mothama, he said, I cannot meet you to-morrow in the field, as needs must be in consequence of my own rashness and the world's opinion, without saying a word or two to clear my conscience and relieve my heart. When I made the charge I did make, I was induced by artful men to believe you guilty. Since then, however, reason and thought, and some accidental discoveries, have made me doubt the fact. Doubt? exclaimed Hugh de Mothama, in a tone of reproach. Well, well, said Allured, to believe that the charge is false. Will that satisfy you? It must, replied Hugh de Mothama. Am I then to suppose that it is the world's opinion, the fear of an idle scoff alone, which makes you draw your sword against a friend, which makes you still urge, but I will not use a term that can pain you, which makes you risk your life and mine, a sister's happiness, and your own repose of mind for ever, all for an idle scoff? Even so, Martha, even so, said Allured to Ashby, in a sad but determined tone. I know it all, all you could urge, but yet you and I are well matched in arms. Both have some renown, yours perhaps higher than my own, from having fought in Palestine, and it is impossible that, after having called you to the field, I can in aught retract, without drawing down upon myself a charge of fear, which must never rest upon my name. Men would say I dared not meet you, and that must not be. Hugh rose from his seat and walked twice across the room, then shook his head with a grieved and sorrowful expression, replying, "'Ashby, you are wrong, but I, on my part, must say no word to shake your resolution. As you judge best, so must you act. But I go to the field with a heart free from wrong. Sad, bitterly sad, 
that I am forced to draw the sword against a man whom I would fain take to my heart with love. Sad, bitterly sad, that whether I live or die, a charge I have not merited brings sorrow upon me. But, as I have said, I will urge no motive upon you to change your purpose. Only hear me, Alured, when I call God and all the holy saints to witness that the thought of injuring your father by word or deed never could cross my mind, that I am, in short, as guiltless of his death as the babe unborn. I believe you, I do believe you indeed, said the young earl. Well then, replied Hugh, I have a charge to give you, Alured. None can tell what the result of such a day as to-morrow may be. I go with my heart bent down with care and sorrow, your sister's love blunts my lance and rusts my sword. Hatred of the task put upon me hangs heavy on my arm, and tis possible that, though mine be the righteous cause, yours the bad one, I may fall and you may conquer. If so, there is a debt of justice which you owe me, and I charge you to execute it, I, as an act of penitence. Proclaim with your own voice the innocence of the man you have slain, seek every proof to show he was not guilty and bring the murderers to the block even should you find them in your own house the earl covered his eyes with his hands and remained silent for a moment but then looked up again saying no no tis i that shall fall the penalty of my own rashness at first the penalty of my own weakness now for it is a weakness will be paid by myself Mothama. I feel that my days are at an end. My death under your lance will clear you of the charge that I have brought against you, and yours will be the task to seek and punish the assassins of my father. And your sister? said Hugh de Mothama. I have seen her, replied her brother. I have seen her and told her my wishes and my will. Of that, no more. Only remember, Mothama, that when to-morrow I call God to witness that my cause is just— the cause I mean is not my charge against you, but the defence of my own honour against the injurious suspicions of the world. Hugh looked at him with a rueful smile. Alas, Alured, he said, I fear the eye of heaven will not see the distinction. Ask your confessor what he thinks of such a reservation. But if it must be so, so let it be. Yet tis a strange thing that two men, most unwilling to do each other wrong, should be doomed by one hasty word to slaughter each other against conscience? Ay, so goes the world, Hugh, replied the earl, and so it will go too, I fear, till the last day. We must all do our devoir as knights. Hugh de Mothama remembered of his knightly oath and the true duties of chivalry, and he could not help thinking that the mere reputation of a lesser virtue was held to be of more importance than the great and leading characteristics of that noble institution. He said nothing, however, for he would not urge the Earl to forego his purpose, and he knew that reproach would irritate, but not change him. "'I grieve, Alured, he said, "'that you feel it so, but as you are the mover in all this, with you must it rest. I can but defend my innocence as best I may.' The tone which the young knight assumed— the calmness, the kindness, the want of all bravado touched Alured de Ashby's heart more than aught else on earth could have done, and wringing Hugh de Mothama's hand, he said, "'Good-bye, good-bye. I believe you innocent from my soul, Mothama, and I would give my right hand that you and I were a hundred miles hence this night.' With these words he quitted the room, and turned his steps towards his own lodging. He had thought, by visiting his adversary, to satisfy those better feelings which, under the pressure of dark and terrible circumstances, had arisen in his heart. He had thought to relieve his bosom of the load that sat upon it, to make his conscience feel light and easy, and to cast off the burden of regret. But the result had been very different. The bitterness in his heart was doubled. Sorrow, shame, anxiety were all increased— and yet not one word or look of him whom he had deeply injured gave human nature the opportunity of rousing up anger to take the place of regret. He felt his heart burn within him, his eyeballs seemed on fire, 
his head ached, and ere he entered the door which led to his apartments, he threw back his hood and walked three or four times up and down the court. He was just about to go in when another figure, coming across from the same side where his lodgings lay, approached and cut him off, as it were, and in a moment after, Guy de Margan was at his side. "'Give you good evening, my lord,' he said. "'Good night,' rejoined Allured, advancing as if to pass him. "'Pray what is the matter with your cousin Richard?' asked the other. "'I met him hurrying through the gates, but now, like a madman.' "'I know not, sir,' replied Allured impatiently. "'But the moment after, he continued in a changed tone. "'By the way, Sir Guy, I would fain speak with you. "'There has been a friend and companion of Richard de Ashby.' "'Well, my lord,' exclaimed Guy de Margan, "'thou hast aided him with all thy might "'to fix the crime of my father's death on Hugh de Mothama,' said the earl, "'and then paused as if for a reply. "'None was made, however, and he went on. "'The accusers may be the accused some day, "'so look to it, look to it,' "'and he turned hastily towards his lodging. Guy de Margan stayed for a moment in the middle of the court, and then darted after Allured de Ashby, exclaiming, "'My lord, my lord, one word. Do you mean to charge me with any share in your father's death? If you do, I demand that this instant before the king you make it publicly. I know too well, my lord, to dare you to arms upon such a quarrel. But if the Earl of Ashby thinks fit first to accuse one, and then another, I will put myself upon my trial by my peers, who will force you to prove your words. Out of my way, reptile, cried the earl, out of my way, or I will stamp upon thy head and crush thee like a poisonous worm. Who accused thee? I did not. I thought the earl of Ashby might seek to avoid fighting his adversary, said Guy de Margan, drawing a step or two back, and wished to do it at my expense. Hugh de Mothama is a renowned knight, and no pleasant foe to meet at Outchance. Allured felt for the pommel of his sword, but he had left it on the table behind him, and springing at once upon Guy de Margan, he caught him by the throat before he could dart away, and hurled him backwards with tremendous force upon the pavement. Stunned and bleeding, Guy de Margan lay without sense or motion, and the young earl, crying, "'Lie there, fox!' strode back to his apartments. Passing hastily through the other rooms to his own chamber, he paused by the side of the table, in deep thought, and then, pronouncing the words, "'A set of knaves and villains!' he filled the agate cup to the brim with wine, raised it to his lips, and drained it to the dregs. End of chapter 41Chapter forty two of Forest Days by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter forty two. Some half hour after she had left the princess, and we will venture to hope that the reader has particularly marked at what precise moment of time each of the scenes which we have lately described were taking place in the castle of Nottingham. Some half hour after she had left the princess, Lucy de Ashby, covered with one of those large gowns of grave cloth, which were worn by the less strict orders of nuns, while travelling, with her fair hair wrapped in a wimple, and a pilgrim's bag hung over shoulder, filled with a few trinkets and some other things which she thought necessary to take with her, leaned thoughtfully upon the table in the wide, oddly-shaped chamber which had been appropriated to her in Nottingham Castle. Near her stood one of the maids, whom we have seen with her before, and who now watched her mistress's countenance and the eager emotions that were passing over it, with a look of anxiety and affection. At length, with a sudden movement, as if she had long restrained herself, the girl burst forth, "'Let me go with thee, lady.' "'You know not where I go, Claude,' replied Lucy. "'You know not, indeed, that I am going anywhere.' "'Yes, yes,' said the girl. "'I am sure you are going somewhere. "'If not,' "'Why have you put on that disguise?' "'But to see if it would do in case of need,' answered Lucy. "'Here, take it off, good girl. "'I should not recognise myself, much less would others.' "'Aye, lady, but still thou art going somewhere,' said the girl, 
aiding her to pull off the wimple and gown. I know not where, tis true, but I will go with thee, anywhere. Neither distance nor danger will scare me, and I am sure I can help thee. Well, be as thou wilt, replied Lucy after a moment's thought, but it may be that we shall leave behind us courts and soft beds for ever, Claude. I care not, I care not, cried the girl. I would rather live with the bold foresters in the wood than a Nottingham or Lindwell either. Lucy smiled, as the girl's words brought back the memory of one happy day, and with it the hopes that then were bright. Well, hasty, she said, hasty to make ready. There are many here who know thee, Claude, and we must both pass unrecognised. Oh, answered her attendant, I will transform me in a minute in such sort that my lover, if I had one, should refuse me at the altar, or else be forsworn. Hark, there is someone knocks. Pull it off, pull it off, cried Lucy, disembarrassing herself of the gown. Now run and see. The princess, madam, requires your instant presence, said the girl, after having spoken for a moment to someone at the door, and with a quick step and eager eye, Lucy de Ashby advanced along the corridor, following one of Eleanor's ladies who had brought the message. The latter opened the door of the princess's chamber for her young companion to enter, but did not, as usual, go in herself, and Lucy found Eleanor and her husband alone. Edward was clothed in arms as he had come from Leicester, dusty and soiled with travelling, but his head was uncovered except by the strong curling hair which waved round his lordly brow, while a small velvet bonnet and feather, in which he had been riding, was seen cast upon one of the settles near the door. He was walking with a slow step up and down the room, with his brows knit and a glance of disappointment and even anger in his eye. Eleanor, on the contrary, sat and gazed on him in silence, with a grave and tender look, as if waiting till the first ebullition of feeling was past, and the moment for soothing or consolation arrived. "'Here she is, Edward,' said the princess, as soon as Lucy entered, and those words showed her that the conversation of her two royal friends had been of herself, and made her fear that the evident anger of Edward had been excited by something she had done. The timid and imploring look which she cast upon him, however, when he turned towards her, instantly banished the frown from his brow, and, taking her hand, he said, "'Be not afraid, dear lady. I am more angry, perhaps, than becomes me, but tis not with you or yours. When I came here some twenty minutes since, my sweet wife gave me this paper, which tends to clear our poor friend Hugh, and I instantly took it to the king to beseech him but to delay the combat for a week. Judge of my surprise when he refused me with an oath— and swore that either your brother should make good his charge or die. But tis not my father's fault, lady, he continued, seeing a look of horror, mingled somewhat with disgust, come upon Lucy's face. Tis not my father's fault, I can assure you. Mortimer and Pembroke and some others who have his ear have so prepossessed his mind that for the moment all words or arguments are vain. And yet this combat must not take place, or one of two noble men will be murdered. "'Then let me try to stop it,' answered Lucy. "'Has the princess, my lord?' "'Yes, yes, she has,' cried Edward. "'And you must try, sweet Lucy. "'But I doubt that even your persuasions, "'I doubt that even the bribe of your fair hand "'will induce Mothama and leave his name to ignominy, "'even for a day.' "'Nay, nay, he will,' said Eleanor, "'certain of his own innocence, "'with the confession of her brother which Lucy has.' that he believes him guiltless. "'Tis but an expression of doubt,' interrupted Edward, "'if you told me right.' "'Nay, Edward,' asked the princess, rising and laying her hand upon his arm, "'if the case were our own, if I besought you with tears and with entreaties and every argument that she can use, would you not yield?' "'Twere a hard case, dear lady mine,' replied Edward, kissing her. "'Twere a hard case in truth,' yet I may doubt. His answer might be clear. With honour, innocence, and courage on his side, why should he fly? "'To save my brother,' said Lucy, looking up in the prince's face. "'Aye, but his renown,' replied Edward. "'Yet he must fly, 
some means must be found to persuade him cannot you my most gracious lord asked lucy ah, that is the question rejoined the prince again walking up and down the room what will be said of me if i interfere my father's anger too to tell a knight to fly from his devoir yet it must be done hark ye fair lady go to him as you have proposed use prayers entreaties whatever may most move him do all that you have proposed offer to go with him and be his bride he scarcely can refuse that methinks and he turned a more smiling look towards eleanor but if all fails tell him that i entreat nay that i command him if he be so sure of shortly proving his innocence that no man can even dream i have done this thing for favour tell him i command him to fly this night and that i will justify him that i will avow twas done by my express command and let me see the man in all my father's realms to blame it will you most gracious lord said lucy will you give it me under your hand if i have but words hugh may think it is a woman's art to win him to her wishes is there an inkhorn there demanded edward looking round here here said the princess showing him the materials for writing and with a rapid hand edward traced a few words upon the paper and then read them but still held the order in his hand remember he said turning to lucy and speaking in an earnest almost a stern tone this is to be the last means you use and not till every other has been tried in vain tis a rash act i fear and somewhat an unwise one that i do though with a good intent and i would fain it were never mentioned were it possible this makes all safe said lucy taking the paper he will go now my lord that his honour is secure but i promise you no entreaties of mine shall be spared to make him go without it i will forget that i have this precious thing until he proves obdurate to all my prayers even then methinks i may show some anger to find him go at any words of yours when he has scorned all mine but good sooth i shall be too grateful to god to see him go at all to let anger have any part well well fair lady said the prince may god send us safely and happily through this dark and sad affair we are told not to do evil that good may come of it but here methinks i only choose between two duties and follow the greater i act against my father's will tis true but thereby i save the shedding of innocent blood and i spare the king himself a deed which he would bitterly repent hereafter god give it a good end i say once more for we act for the best fear not fear not my edward said eleanor god will not fail those that trust in him may he protect thee lucy and as she spoke she kissed her young friend's forehead tenderly now tell me she continued is all prepared for your expedition all replied lucy my girl claude has got me a grey sister's gown which will conceal me fully is that all cried the prince where are the horses but leave that to me if mothama consents to go bid him make no delay no stay for any preparation he will find horses at the city gate the northern gate i mean in half an hour they shall be there know you the way to his lodgings not well said lucy tis i think the third door down the court but claude will find it quickly i don't doubt there is a speedier way than that replied the prince follow the passage running by your room then down the steps and you will see a door if you knock there you will find his page or some other servant for it leads into his ante-room it were better he continued thoughtfully that you made a servant carry the disguise and not assume it till you are sure that he will go were you to visit him in such a garb fair lady he added taking her hand kindly and after to return unwedded men might speak lightly of your reputation and that which in holy purity of heart you did to avert a most needless combat might turn to your discredit the blood came warmly into lucy's cheek but the moment after she looked up in the prince's face replying with an air of ingenious candour you think me doubtless somewhat bold my lord and many men may censure me but i have something here and she laid her hand upon her heart which blames me not but bids me go 
in innocence of purpose, and share his fate, whatever it may be. God knows this is a sad and painful bridal, such as I never thought to see. A father's death, a brother's rashness, and a lover's danger may well cloud it with sorrow, but there is a higher joy in thinking I am doing what is right, in thinking that I, a poor, weak girl, by scorning idle tongues and the coarse jests of those who cannot feel as I can, have a power to save my brother's life, and to spare him I love, the dreadful task of putting a bloody barrier twixt himself and me for ever. Judge me aright, my lord. I do, I do, replied Edward, and now farewell. God speed you, lady, on your noble enterprise. Lucy kissed his hand, and without more ado returned to her own chamber. Quick, Claude, she cried, are you ready? Yes, madam, she answered. Will you not put on the gown? No, said Lucy, still pausing at the door. Bring them with you and follow quickly. The girl gathered up the lady's disguise and her own in haste, and Lucy led the way along the passage as the prince had directed her. There were no doors on either side, and but a loophole every here and there, which showed that the corridor along which they went was practised in the wall. Full of renewed hope and eager to see her scheme put in execution, the lady descended the steps and was about at once to knock at the door when her raised hand was stayed by hearing someone speaking. She felt faint, and her heart beat quickly, for she recognised her brother's voice. Lucy listened, and distinctly heard the words, "'I believe you innocent from my soul, Mothama, and I would give my right hand that you or I were a hundred miles hence this night.' A smile came upon her countenance. "'He is preparing the way for me,' she murmured to herself, and again she listened but all was silent, save a retreating step and a closing door. "'He is gone,' said Lucy, turning to her maid. "'Stay you here, Claude, for a minute or two. And without knocking, she gently opened the door and looked in. There was a small room before her, with a fire on the opposite side, and three stools near it, but no one there, and entering with a noiseless step, Lucy gazed round. A door appeared on either hand, that on the right was closed, but through it she heard sounds of talking and laughter. That on the left was in a slight degree ajar, but all was silent within. Gliding up to it with no noise but the light rustle of her garments, Lucy approached and pushed it gently with her hand, so gently that she saw before she was seen. Nearly in the centre of the room stood he whom she loved, with his arms folded on his broad chest, his fine head bent, his eyes fixed upon the ground, and an expression both sorrowful and stern upon his lip and brow. As the door moved farther open, it roused him from his reverie, and he looked up. But what a sudden change came instantly upon his countenance! An expression mingled of joy, surprise, and anxiety passed across his face, and exclaiming, "'Lucy! Dearest Lucy!' he sprang forward to meet her. Drawing her gently into the room, he closed the door, and then held her for a moment to his bosom, while both were silent. For the throbbing of her heart left Lucy's tongue powerless, and Hugh dared not speak lest it should dispel what seemed but too happy a dream. "'Dearest Lucy,' he said at length, "'even while I thank and bless you for coming, I must ask you what brings you here. It was rash, dear girl, it was rash.' If you had sent to me, I would have been with you in a moment. It is not a minute yet since your brother was here. I know it, replied Lucy. I know it all, Hugh. I know it was rash to come, but I am going to do everything that is rash tonight. And this is but the beginning. It is in general that you men sue to us women, till you are our masters at least. Now I come to sue to you. Oh, Lucy, cried Hugh, with a sort of prescience, of what she was about to say. What is it you are going to ask? Remember, Lucy, remember my honour. If you love me, that honour ought to be dearer to you than my life. Ask me nothing that may bring shame upon me. Listen to me, listen to me, she replied. You must hear me, Hugh, before you can judge. Your honour is dearer to me than your life, and, oh, Hugh, you have yet to learn how dear that is to Lucy de Ashby and as she spoke the tears rose into her eyes, but she dashed them away and went on. 
yet it is not for your life i fear dear as it is to me oh no your heart is safe panoplied in innocence and strength you go but to conquer it is for my brother that i fear for my rash and hasty brother i am guilty if you will for he who brings a false accusation against an innocent man is guilty i tremble for him hugh i tremble for myself too i fear that hugh de Mothama will draw upon his hand my brother's blood and a hand so stained can never clasp mine again i know it said hugh but what can i do i have no choice lucy but to live for misery or to die disgraced yes cried lucy eagerly yes you have fly hugh de Mothama. give no reason to any one why you go you are sure ere long to establish your innocence appear not at the sound of the trumpet appear not till you can prove his guilt upon the foul wretch who did the deed with which they charge you what exclaimed hugh de Mothama, to be condemned not only as a criminal but as a coward and a recreant to have my name passed from mouth to mouth throughout all europe as a byword to have heralds say when they would point out a craven and a traitor he is like hugh de Mothama. oh lucy lucy think of my honour think of my renown but your honour is safe hugh answered lucy clinging to his arm alarid himself admits your innocence i heard him say but now ay in this room between him and me replied hugh de Mothama. but to-morrow he goes into the lists and called god to witness that his cause is just to me he owns the falsehood of the charge but to the world upholds that it is true not so cried lucy look here Mothama, see what he says to me here and she drew forth the paper which alirid had given her hugh read it eagerly and he saw her brother's wish expressed that if he fell their hands might be united he turned his eyes towards the sweet girl beside him with a look of tenderness and love deep and unutterable and then the moment after waving his head with a melancholy air he said he knows you not as i know you lucy his wish is kind and generous noble most noble and atones for all but would lucy follow it no she replied raising her head firmly were i to waste away my life in hopeless regret and misery my hand should never be given to him who sheds my brother's blood i vow it so help me god at my utmost need but hear me hugh she continued her cheek which had been very pale during the last words becoming crimson hear me hugh hear me my beloved hear me and hold grant my request as eagerly as fondly as ever you have sued for this hand i now beseech you to take it on my knees hugh de Mothama, and she sunk upon her knees before him on my knees thus bedewing your hand with my tears i beseech you to make lucy de ashby your wife but how dearest lucy he cried stooping to raise her what what do you mean how how is this to be fly exclaimed lucy fly with me this night here is my brother's full consent here also is your justification here at the very first he proclaims your innocence ah no replied hugh de Mothama, shaking his head he says but that he doubts my guilt oh lucy you will drive me mad to give me such a precious sight in prospect and then to sweep it all away i tell thee my beloved there is not an honest man in all the realm that would not call me coward if i fled is that all that stays you demanded lucy what if i show you that amongst the highest and most honourable of the land there are those who will exculpate and defend you you cannot do it lucy replied hugh you may think they would they may have said some chance words that it were better to fly that i might avoid the combat for some days but when the time came their voices would be raised with all the rest against me you can show me no more than this dear girl i can answered lucy there read that if you hesitate a moment more tis that hugh de Mothama loves not his promised bride rejects her proffered hand and scorns the rash and giddy girl who for the sake of any ungrateful man casts from her every thought but one the saving those she loves hugh de Mothama held the paper in his hand for a moment without reading it 
gazing upon the beautiful being beside him, as with her eyes full of lustre and light, her cheek glowing, her lip quivering, she addressed to him the only reproachful words which had ever fallen from her lips. "'Lucy,' he said, "'I will not merit that reproach. "'You yourself had told me "'that my honour is dearer to you than my life. "'Let it be dearer than all other things, Lucy, "'and then tell me whether I can go with honour. "'Whether, if I do, men will not cry coward on me, "'whether my renown will not suffer in the eyes of Europe. "'If you say yes, so oh, with what joy will I fly, "'with Lucy for my companion?' With what deep devotion will I strive through life to repay her generous self-devotion, and to show her what I think of that heart which will cast away all idle forms and ceremonies, set at naught empty opinion, and entertain, as you say, but the one thought, the saving those she loves. As he spoke, he clasped his arms around her, and Lucy hid her eyes upon his bosom, for they were running over with tears. But after a moment she raised them again, saying, "'Read, read, you. that will satisfy you.' Hugh de Mothama approached nearer the lamp, and looking at the paper exclaimed, "'Prince Edward's writing. What is this?' "'Follow the plan of your fair lady, Mothama. Fly with her as speedily as may be. She will tell you more, but fear not for your honour. I will be your warranty, and will say it was my command. You are my prisoner still, remember, and as such cannot fight without the consent of Edward.' "'This changes all,' cried Hugh de Mothama. "'But why not give me this before, Lucy?' "'Because the prince required me so to act,' replied Lucy. "'Only to use this as a last resource.' And she went on to tell him, briefly but clearly, all that had occurred. "'Let us be quick,' she said. "'Dear Hugh, there will be horses down at the north gate by this time. "'My poor girl, Claude, is waiting on the steps with a nun's gown for me and some cunning disguise for herself. Have you nothing that you could cast over these gay garments? For as you are about to travel by night with a poor grey sister, t'were as well not to seem so much the courtly cavalier. Poor Lucy's heart, relieved from the burden that had rested on it, beat up high with renewed hope. But still the agitation which she suffered remained, like the flying clouds that follow a summer's storm, and filled her eyes with tears, while the jest was still upon her lips. Hugh held her to his heart and soothed her, and might have felt inclined to spend a few minutes more in such a sweet employment, but Lucy reminded him of how quickly moved the wings of time. "'Remember, Hugh,' she said, "'the minutes and my courage are not stable things, and both are ebbing fast. My heart beats strangely quick and fearfully, and I must not faint or lag behind till we have passed the gates.' "'Nor there, either,' cried Hugh. "'But your courage will rise, dear Lucy, when the immediate danger is past. "'We had better not go quite alone, however, "'for we may yet have to use the strong hand by the way. "'I will send down Blorkit and another to the gate with horses for themselves.' "'But a disguise,' cried Lucy, "'a disguise for you. "'Ere we quit the castle, all this gold and silk will send the tale abroad "'to every horse-boy in the place.' "'I have one ready,' answered Hugh. "'The priest's gown, in which I escaped before, "'may answer well a second time. "'Where is this girl of yours?' "'Upon the steps,' replied Lucy. "'I will call her. "'Nay, let me,' said Hugh de Mothama, "'and opening the door of the ante-room, "'and then that which opened on the stairs, "'he whispered, "'Come in, my pretty maiden. "'Bring the lamp with you. "'I will be back directly.' "'And passing on into the outer room "'as soon as the maid was in his chamber,' and had shut the door, he called Blorkit aside and gave him orders. Then, sitting down at a table, he wrote a few words on a scrap of paper, which he entrusted to one of the armourers, saying, "'Do not disturb Sir John Hardy to-night, but give him that at daybreak to-morrow morning.' "'Twere a hard matter to disturb him,' answered the man, "'for he's asleep by this time, and when once his eyes are shut, lightning will not make them wink for eight hours to come.' "'It matters not,' rejoined Hugh. "'Tomorrow will be soon enough. "'Only be sure to give it.' "'And thus saying, he returned to his chamber, "'closing the doors carefully behind him. "'The young knight actually started "'when he beheld Lucy in the grey gown and wimple. "'Such was the change which it had made. "'You see, Hugh,' she cried, smiling, "'as she remarked his surprise. 
You see what Lucy's beauty is made of? It all disappears when you take away from her her gay apparel and cover her with the dull stole of the nun. There might be a little coquetry in what she said, for Hugh de Mothermer could make but one answer, and he made it. But to say the truth, it was the coquetry of agitation, for Lucy sought to cover her own fears and prevent her mind from resting on them. No time was now lost, however. The black gown of the priest was speedily found and thrown over the other garments of the young knight, and then the question became how they were to go forth without passing through the room in which the servants and followers of Hugh de Mothema were sitting. "'Can we not return by the steps in this passage, madam?' asked Claude. "'Close to the door of your room there is the little staircase which leads by the tower to the great court.' "'That will be the best way,' said Hugh. "'Draw the veil over your face, dear Lucy. "'No one will know us in such a guise as this, "'and there is little chance that we shall meet any one. The plan proposed was adopted, and neither in the corridor nor on the staircase did they find a living creature, though as they came near the apartments of the prince and princess, steps were heard going on before them, and then a door opened and shut at some little distance. They reached the court, too, in safety, and Hugh de Mothama took a step or two forward to see that all was clear. A flash of light, however, proceeding from the main building, caused him instantly to draw back again, under the shelter of the doorway. "'There are torches burning,' he said. "'Does the king ascend by this staircase?' "'Never that I know of,' replied Lucy. "'Never,' said the girl Claude. "'Never.' Hugh de Mothama pushed the door partly to, but looked out through the remaining aperture to see what was passing. "'There is a crucifix,' he said, "'and the host. They are carrying the sacrament to someone in extremis.' "'St. Mary, bless me!' cried the girl Claude, as he mentioned the word crucifix. "'I have forgot mine,' and away she ran up the stairs again to seek her cross, which she had left behind. End of chapter 42「of Forest Days by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 43 Richard de Ashby smoothed his brow and calmed his look as he crossed from a tavern, where he had been making some inquiries, to a house on the opposite side of the street, not very far from the gates of the castle. It was a large stone building, close to an old church which then stood on that part of the hill, and as it contained several habitations, the entrance of the common staircase was, as usual in such circumstances, left open. Ascending cautiously, guided by a rope which passed through iron rings, followed the tortuous course of the staircase. Richard de Ashby reached the first floor and knocked at a small door on his right hand. Nobody appeared, and after waiting for several minutes he knocked again. This time he was more successful. The door was opened by a small, strange-looking being, dressed in the garb of an old woman, with a brown and wrinkled face and little bright grey eyes. She held a lamp in her hand, and gazing upon the countenance of the visitor with a keen and not very placable look, she asked, "'What do you want?' "'I want Father Mark,' replied Richard de Ashby. "'He is out visiting the sick,' said the old dame. "'Nay, now,' she continued in a petulant tone, "'I will answer all your questions at once before you can put them. "'They all run in the same round. "'Father Mark is out. "'I don't know where he is gone. "'I don't know when he'll come here. "'If you want to see him here, you must come again. "'If you want him to come to any sick man, "'you must leave word where. "'Now you have it all.' Richard de Ashby had some acquaintance with the world, and fancied that he knew perfectly the character of the person before him. Drawing out, therefore, a small French piece of gold, called an enyel, he slipped it into the old woman's hand, who instantly held it up to the lamp, crying, "'What's this? What's this? Gold, as I live! Merry mother, you are a civil gentleman, my son. What is it that you want?' "'Simply an answer to a question.' said Richard to Ashby. "'Is there a young lady staying here, a pretty young lady, called Kate Greenley? You know her, methinks, do you not?' "'Know her? To be sure I do,' replied the old woman. "'A blessing upon her pretty heart. She's been up here many a time, and I've carried a message for her before now, and she gave me some silver pieces and a bodkin. I've got it somewhere about me now.' And she began to feel in her bodice for poor Kate Greenley's gift." 
"'Then she is not here now?' said Richard to Ashby. "'No, no,' answered the old woman. "'She was here an hour before sunset, but she went away again. "'Oh, I know how it is,' she cried, as if a sudden thought had struck her. "'You are the gentleman whom good father Mark has been preaching to her to run away from, "'because you are living in a state of naughtiness. "'These friars are so hard upon young folks. "'And now you'd give another gold piece like this, I'd swear, to know where she is.' and get her to come back again ay would i replied richard to ashby too well well continued the old woman i know something if i choose to say she is not in nottingham but not far off can you show me where she is demanded richard to ashby not to-night not to-night cried the old woman santa maria i would not go out to-night all that way nor for a purse full of gold why it is up after you get out of the gates through back lane and down the thorny walk till you come to the edge of thorny wood and then you turn to the right by old gaffer brown's cottage and round under the chapel and along by the bank where the fountain is and then up by the new planting just between it and the fern hill and then if you go straight on and take the first to the left and the fourth to the right it brings you to old sweeting's hut where she has gone to live with him and his good dame. Richard de Ashby saw no possible means of discovering the way from the old lady's description, and he was about to propose some other means of arranging the affair, when, with a shrewd wink of the eye, she said, "'I'm going out to her in the grey of morning myself, and if you have any message to send her, I can take it. Or if a gentleman chooses to wait at the gate and walk into the country after an old woman, who can help it?' "'I mustn't go with you through the town, you know, for that would make a scandal.' "'I understand, I understand,' said Richard. "'And if by your means I get her back again, you shall have two gold pieces such as that.' "'Oh, an open hand gets all at once,' replied the priest's maid. "'A close fist keeps what it has gone. An open hand gets all at once.' "'Tis a true proverb, Sir Knight, a true proverb.' "'At the north gate, you know, in the grey of morning. "'Wait till you see me come out with my basket, "'and then don't say a word, but come after.' "'You are going to her, then?' asked Richard to Ashby. "'Yes, yes,' said the old woman impatiently. "'I am going to carry her news from the good father "'of all that has happened in the castle to-night. "'But go along now, go along. "'I am afraid of his coming back and finding you here. "'Then he might think something, you know, "'at the north gate in the grey of the morning.' "'I will not fail,' replied Richard de Ashby, and turning away he slowly descended the stairs. The old woman paused not to look after him, but closed the door, muttering and talking to herself. The life of Richard de Ashby had arrived at one of those moments so fearful, so terrible, in the career of wickedness, when one offence following another has accumulated scheme upon scheme, each implying new crimes and new dangers, and each, though intended to guard the other, offering like the weakened frontier of an overextended empire but new points of peril but fresh necessity of defence tis unfortunate he thought as he turned from the door tis unfortunate that i have not found her but she is absent from the city and that is one point gained the moment however that his mind had thus cast off the thought of kate greenley and the secret she possessed it turned with maddening rapidity to all the other points of his situation what shall i do with the body he asked himself i cannot let it lie and rot there i wonder how fares my cousin alured he has surely drank the wine oh yes i know him he has drunk it and more too if that man ellaby were not hovering round about all might be secure still the word still showed better than any other the state of his mind though he hid it from himself he knew in short that he was anything but secure over his head hung the awful cloud of coming detection and punishment he saw it with his eyes he felt it in his heart that the tempest was about to descend and as those who in a thunderstorm gallop away from the flashing lightning are said to draw it more surely on their own heads so his desperate efforts to save himself only called down more surely the approaching retribution the next minute his mind reverted to the corpse again this carrion of dighton he thought 
it were well perhaps to dare the thing openly to give him a simple but a public funeral to call the priests to aid and pay them well with them one is always sure to get a good word for one's money tis but to say he was brought to my house in my absence and died there while i was away what have i to do with his death tis no affair of mine i will hie up to the castle and spy what is going on oh that could prove that allurid has drunk wine or broken bread in the room of hugh de Mothama. that were a stroke indeed but at all events he has been with him who can tell how a man may be poisoned tis at all events suspicious that he should be with him just before his death i will not go into the court i will just look through the gates and speak to the warder for a moment or two the gates are not closed till nine and thus saying he retrod his steps to the castle gate when he reached it there was nobody there but as he looked through the archway into the court he saw the figures of the warder and several soldiers standing with their backs turned towards him gazing towards the other side of the building there was a bright light coming from that point and taking a step farther forward under the archway he perceived a procession of priests and boys of the chapel with torches and crucifixes borne before them while a tall old man was seen carrying reverently the consecrated bread the solemn train took its way direct towards the lodging of alred de ashby and turning back with feelings in which were mingled in a strange and indescribable manner anguish and satisfaction horror and relief richard de ashby murmured it is done it is done and sped his way homeward with the quick but irregular footstep of crime and terror it were painful to watch him through the progress of that night sleep was banished from his eyelids sleep that will visit the couch of utter despair came not near the troubled brain of doubt and apprehension and anxiety he walked to and fro in his chamber he laid not down his head upon his bed he sat gloomily gazing on the pale untrimmed lamp he rested his eyes upon his folded arms while dizzy images of sorrow and distress and dying men and shame and agony and scorn and anguish here and punishment hereafter whirled before his mental vision from which no effort could shut them out thus passed he the hours till a faint blue light began to mingle with the glare of the expiring lamp and then starting up he hastily threw on a hood and cloak and leaving his servants sleeping in the house proceeded towards the north gate of the town it had been an angry and stormy night and the rain which was running off the rocky streets of nottingham still hung upon the green blades of grass and the boughs of the trees which in that day came almost up to the walls of the city the clouds were clearing off however and blue patches were seen mingling with the mottled white and grey overhead while to the right of the town a yellow gleam appeared in the sky showing the rapid coming of the sun such was the scene as richard de ashby looked through the gate of nottingham which was thronged with peasantry bringing in their wares to the market even at that early hour it was a sight refreshing and bright to the eye and might have soothed any other mind than his but the fire that burnt internally that throbbed in his heart and thrilled through his veins made the cool air of the autumnal morning feel like the chill of fever where shivering cold spreads over the outer frame while the intense heat remains unquelled within one of the first objects that his eyes lighted upon was the form of the old woman standing without the gate and looking back towards it and hurrying on he was at her side in a minute ha ha she said in her usual broken and tremulous voice you are a liar bed i thought you were not coming well let us speed on and forward she walked certainly not at the most rapid pace while richard de ashby asked her many a question about old gaffer's sweeting and his good dame what was his age whether he had any sons and whether there were many cottages thereabout the old woman answered querulously but none the less satisfactorily he was an old man of seventy-three she said and he had two sons but one had died in consequence of a fall from a tree and another had been killed at lewis houses she exclaimed few houses i trow why that's the very reason that good father mark sent the girl there wherever there are houses or young men there is temptation for us poor women that this place is quite a desert like that where the eremites lived that he talks of if you don't tempt her i don't know who will there 
Thus talking, she tottered on, leading the way through sundry lanes and hamlets, and explaining to her companion at each new house they came to, that this was such a place which she had mentioned the night before, and that was another. Very soon, however, the cottages grew less and less in number, for towns had not at that time such extensive undefending suburbs as they have acquired in more peaceful days, and at length they came to the chapel which she had named, the bell of which was going as they approached. The good dame would needs turn in to say a prayer or two, and it was in vain that Richard de Ashby urged her to go forward, for she seemed one of those who harden themselves in their own determinations as soon as they see themselves in the slightest degree opposed. "'No, no,' she said, "'you would not have me pass the chapel and the bell going, would you? "'It's very well for you men who have no religion at all. "'So go on, go on, if you will. "'I will not be a minute. "'I have five aves and a pater noster, "'and a credo to repeat, and that won't take me a minute. "'You can't miss the way. "'Go on, I will soon overtake you.' "'Richard de Ashby did not think that the usual rate "'of the old lady's progression would produce that result.' but as the idea of prayer, and all connected with it, was unpleasant to his mind, he strode gloomily on for some hundred yards from the chapel, revolving still the same painful images which had tormented him during the livelong night. In a shorter time than he had expected, however, the old woman came out of the chapel, and he again proceeded on the path, walking on before her, and losing all sight of human habitation, but following a small byway along the sandy ground of which might be traced sundry footsteps and the marks of a horse's hoofs. Though his step was slow, the old woman did not overtake him for near three quarters of a mile, still keeping in sight and talking to herself as she came after. The trees soon grew thicker on the left hand, the country more wild and broken on the right, and at length about a hundred and fifty yards in front appeared a small, low cottage, or rather hut, resting on the edge of the wood. The path now spread out into an open green space, a sort of rugged lane some forty yards broad, extending from the spot where Richard de Ashby first saw the cottage to the low and shattered door, and the place looked so poor and miserable that he said to himself, "'If this be the abode the priest has assigned to her, it will not be difficult to persuade her to come back to softer things. I will tell her I am going to take her with me to London,' and to the gay things of the capital. "'Is this the cottage, good dame?' he continued, turning his head over his shoulder, and speaking aloud to the old woman, who was now not more than a couple of yards behind. "'To be sure,' replied she, "'did I not tell you it was here?' Richard de Ashby took two or three steps more in advance, straining his eyes upon the hut, but then he thought he saw first one figure, and after that another dart from the wood, and disappeared behind the cottage with a rapidity of movement not like that of old age. A sudden fear came over him, and stopping short he exclaimed, "'What is this, old hag? There are men there!' Dropping the basket from her hand in an instant, with a bound like that of a wild beast and a loud scream, unlike any tone of, of a human voice, the old woman sprang upon the shoulders of Richard de Ashby and writhed her long, thin arms through his, with tightening folds like those of a large serpent. "'Ha, ha, ha!' she shouted. "'Come forth, my merry men. Come forth. Tangel has got him. Tangel has got him. We'll eat his heart. We'll eat his heart and roast him over a slow fire.' In vain Richard de Ashby writhed. In vain he struggled to cast off the grasp of the strange being who held him. With a suppleness and strength almost superhuman, Tangel clung to him like the fatal garment of Alcides, not to be torn away. His fingers seemed made of iron, his arms were as ropes, and Richard de Ashby, casting himself down, rolled over him upon the ground, struggled and turned and strove to break loose, without unclasping in the slightest degree the folds in which he held him. At the same time, the steps of men running fast reached his ear, his eye caught the figures of several persons hurrying from the cottage, and, when Tangela at length relaxed his grasp, Richard de Ashby found himself a prisoner, bound hand and foot. End of chapter 43「Chapter 44 of Forest Days by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Chapter 44 In a wide, open field by the side of the Trent were erected the lists for a battle at Outrance. All the usual preparations had been made. There was a pavilion for the king to keep his state. There were galleries for the ladies. There were tents for the challenger and the challenged. And there were numerous other booths for the shelter and refreshment of any who might come from far to witness one of the most solemn acts of chivalry. Before the hour of eleven, a great multitude had assembled, and every moment the crowd was increasing. For rumours of strange kinds had not only spread through Nottingham during the early morning, but had found their way to all the country round about, and every one was eager to see with his own eyes how the whole would end. In all parts of the field men might be seen, each inquiring what the other knew, and, for the most part, each acknowledging his own ignorance of the exact state of the case. Although here, as everywhere else, persons were to be found who pretended to know a great deal of subjects with which they were utterly unacquainted. All that seemed certain was that the gates of the castle had been shut since the morning, and nobody had been suffered to issue forth but one or two servants of the king and the prince, who, after delivering some brief message in the city, had returned immediately, answering no questions, and affording even accidentally no information. Two or three reported, indeed, that a body of some ten or twelve men had entered the castle, coming from the side of Pontefract. They wore no armour, and did not seem soldiers, and by the appearance of their dress and horses it was judged that they had travelled all night. Numerous other rumours, indeed, circulated round the lists, and the opinion was generally gaining ground that there would be no combat at all, when this supposition was at once done away by the appearance of heralds and pursuivants on the ground, examining it scrupulously, to ascertain that all was clear and fair, without pitfall, trap for the horse's foot, molehill, or inequality, which could give an undue advantage to one or other of the combatants. Shortly after, these officers were followed by several of the king's pages and attendants, who first busied themselves in putting the pavilion prepared for him into neat and proper order, and then stood talking in the front, making great men of themselves, and fancying that they might be mistaken for some of the royal family. The blast of a trumpet was then heard at a short distance, and coming at a quick pace, a body of men-at-arms appeared, and took up their station in military array at either end of the lists, keeping on the outside of the barriers. A pause of some five minutes ensued, and the people, watching and commenting upon all the arrangements, congratulated themselves on the certainty of seeing two fellow-creatures engage in mortal conflict and began to speculate upon which would be the victor. Many were present, merely guided by fancy or report, decided upon the chances of the field, without ever having seen either of the two competitors. But there were many of the tenantry of Lindwell, and peasantry from the neighbourhood of the Earl of Ashby's castle, who, of course, maintained the honour of their lord, and asserted that he would win the field from any knight in Europe. It was remarked, however, that even their boldest statements regarding their young lord's prowess were coupled with an expression of their conviction that, howsoever that might be, they were sure enough the young lord of Mothama had never killed the old earl. Why should he? Hugh de Mothama, indeed, was not without his partisans amongst the people, for he was well known in that part of the country, and a very general feeling that he was both innocent and injured raised up in his favour that generous spirit which is almost always found though strangely mingled with prejudices and passions, in the bosom of an Englishman. About half-past eleven, a number of yeomen, dressed in their holiday clothes, mingled with the crowd. They were without bows, but each had his six arrows at his side, and his short sword and buckler. Each, too, had many acquaintances among the crowd, and, with others to whom they did not actually speak, a gay glance of recognition and familiar nod were interchanged as they made their way up to the lists. "'What? Miller?' said one of the farmers, as a yeoman in the gay green passed him. "'Why have you brought your arrows with you? There are no butts here.' "'There are butts everywhere, Winken,' replied the person addressed. "'But you have no bow,' rejoined the countryman. "'Bows won't be wanted if we need them,' answered the yeoman, and passed on. Scarcely was this conversation concluded when, slowly riding down from the side of Nottingham, 
was seen a gallant train of gentlemen, and many a fair lady, too, it must be confessed, notwithstanding the bloody nature of the scene about to be performed. "'The king! The king!' shouted many voices. "'The king and the prince! God bless Prince Edward!' But few added the monarch's name to the benediction. All that Henry heard, however, was the shout of gratulation, and fancying himself popular, he bowed gracefully to the people, and rode on to the entrance of the pavilion prepared for him, which was soon filled with the lords and ladies of his court. To the surprise of most there present, the Princess Eleanor was seen upon the king's right hand, and many were the comments made upon her appearing, for the first time, to witness a judicial combat. In the meanwhile, Prince Edward, followed by several heralds in their bright tabards, and accompanied by two knights unarmed, rode on to the other end of the lists and entered the field. He himself was clothed in a shining hauberk of steel rings, with a hood of the same, but with his chapeau de fer, shield and lance borne by esquires on foot. His face was thus completely seen, and it was gay and smiling. His princely carriage, his commanding height, his management of the strong fiery horse that bore him, his frank and noble expression of countenance, all had their effect upon the hearts of the people around, and loud and reiterated shouts of gratulation rent the sky as he rode along the lists. After he had spoken for a few minutes with the heralds and pursuivants, Edward turned to one of the knights who had accompanied him, saying, "'Go to the Earl of Ashby's tent and tell him he is too weak to fight in this day's field. The yeoman who first drank of the cup is dead, you say.' "'He died very shortly after, my lord,' replied the knight, "'having scarce time to make confession, "'and to acknowledge that when Sir Richard had left the earl's lodging, "'he went to the chamber, and finding the cup well nigh full of wine, "'drank it off.' "'It must have been a subtle poison indeed,' rejoined the prince. "'Gadston tells me it cost him all his skill to save the earl. "'But go to him, and say that he is too weak. "'If he will withdraw the charge,' "'Well, if not, let him put off the combat for a week. "'No dishonour shall follow in either case.' "'The knight rode away, and Edward, turning to the other who had accompanied him, demanded, "'They have not found him yet?' "'No, my lord,' replied the other. "'Every place was searched in vain. "'There lay the dead body in the room above. "'It is that of a man called Dighton. "'I knew his face at once, having seen him often with Ellaby, "'and other such scurvy cattle.' "'hanging about London and Westminster.' "'Sir John has got a short answer,' said the prince, "'as looking towards a tent at the western corner of the lists, "'he saw the knight he had sent away, "'remounting his horse to return. "'I have seldom seen a man so obstinate.' "'In two minutes the messenger was by the prince's side again. "'He will not hear of it, my lord,' exclaimed the knight as he rode up. "'He declares that men indeed would call him coward now, "'if for a few hours' sickness he should shirk the conflict.' "'Well, then, it must go on,' replied the prince, looking down. "'He may find himself mistaken yet. "'Go to the other tent and speak with Sir John Hardy. "'See what he says.' "'While the knight was absent, "'the prince rode round the lists "'and approached the spot where Henry and Eleanor were seated. "'He spoke a few words to each, "'but as he was about to turn away, "'Eleanor, whose look displayed some small anxiety, "'bent her head forward and asked in a low voice, "'Are you quite sure, dear lord?' "'I think so,' answered the prince, "'but yet I see no one appears. "'It will never be too late, however, to interpose myself. "'The letter said they would be here before the time. "'Ha! Here comes the challenger.' "'At the moment that he spoke, "'his eyes were fixed upon the tent or pavilion "'of the young Earl of Ashby, "'from which was seen to issue forth "'a figure clothed in a complete suit of armour, "'consisting of the hauberk, or shirt of mail, "'the chausses of mail, and the casque of steel, with a crest and a moving visor, or avantile of bars. He wore no poor point over his armour, and the only thing that distinguished him from the ordinary man-at-arms were the poilins, or joints of steel plates at the knees and arms of the hauberk, which were the first approximation of the plate armour which soon after came into use. All eyes were turned in that direction, as well as those of the prince, and every one remarked that the young earl leaned, as he walked from the entrance of the tent to the horse's side, upon the arm of Sir Harry Grey, who appeared in the field as his godfather. 
and as the rumour had become by this time general that an attempt had been made to poison him on the preceding night a loud murmur rang amongst the people of he's not fit he's not fit don't let him fight but alured de ashby put his foot into the stirrup and mounted his horse with apparent difficulty and then sat firm and upright in the saddle well beast he cried patting the charger's neck thou canst bear the arms that weary me and moving onward to the other end of the lists his attendants following with his lance and shield he saluted the king and princess as he passed and bowed his head lowly to the prince this is mere madness my good lord said edward riding up to his side i really feel that as judge of the field i cannot let this go on i must do my devoir fair sir answered alured de ashby i am neither craven nor recreant and here i stand in arms to defend my honour edward was about to reply but at that moment the knight he had sent to the other pavilion approached at a quick pace and whispered something in the prince's ear that they are ready for the field said edward in a tone of amazement what may this mean well let the heralds make proclamation then and we will part the sun and wind at a sign from the prince's truncheon or warder the trumpet sounded aloud and a herald spurring forward his horse proclaimed that all persons were to quit the field but the knight challenger and his respondent the heralds and officers of arms the judge of the combat and his esquires a momentary bustle and much confusion took place for a number of persons upon one pretence or another were at this time within the lists but all was soon clear and alured de ashby being placed in the spot adjudged by the heralds to the challenger braced on his shield and took his lance in his hand bearing it perpendicular with the steel in the air and the other end resting on his foot an esquire unarmed stood on each side with two pages behind and the field being clear sir harry gray placed a purse of gold in the hands of the principal herald saying that for the good knight's cask the herald bowed his head replying largesse noble lord is the combat both of lance and sword that matters not said sir harry gray he pays for the lance and the lance covers the sword the herald then spurred forward some twenty steps followed by his pursuivants and after a loud flourish of the trumpets proclaimed that there stood alured earl of ashby ready to do battle against hugh de mothama lord of amesbury on certain charges brought by him alured against the said hugh having first made oath according to the law of arms that this quarrel was just and righteous and was ready to wager his body on god's decision now if the said hugh of mothama continued the herald will maintain that the said charge is false and groundless and venture his body in that behalf let him appear before the third sound of the trumpet or if not let him surrender himself into the hands of our lord the king to be dealt with according to his demerits oh yea oh yea oh yea let no man on pain of forfeiture of life or limb according to the pleasure of the king give any comfort or encouragement to either the said alured earl of ashby or hugh lord of mothama by sign word or cry and let god defend the right sound trumpets a long loud call of the trumpet succeeded and all looks turned towards the other pavilion before which appeared two horses fully caparisoned the banner of the house of mothama and several pages and attendants the pavilions themselves it must be remarked were encircled with rails joining those of the lists but separated from the actual field of combat by a small movable barricade behind the tent on which every one was now looking and at the far side of it farthest from the royal scaffolding a good deal of bustle and confusion seemed to be taking place and the space of time allotted after the first call of the trumpet passed away without any one appearing to answer the challenge sound again cried the herald and again the blast of the trumpet was heard upon which the hangings of the tent were almost immediately drawn back and hugh de mothama armed but bareheaded advanced towards the barrier this is not right murmured the prince when first his eyes fell upon him but the next instant he saw more on the right hand of hugh was sir john hardy and on the left his uncle the old earl of mothama two esquires bore the knight's lance and shield 
a page between them carried his helmet and in this guise the whole party advanced on foot towards the barrier which was raised to give them admission into the lists but close behind them came four men bearing on their shoulders something like a bier covered with a little tilt of curtains formed of some light cloth a party of yeomen followed guarding two men who walked between them with their arms tied their hoods were turned back exposing the whole head and face and as they advanced the first of the two prisoners rolled his eyes fiercely round with a look like that of a maniac while the second bent his gaze steadfastly upon the ground and never gave a glance on either side ha what is this exclaimed allured to ashby what means all this ah i see now tis richard they have got and the dead body in the beer most like my lord i guess the rest and so do i said edward let us ride on and see both spurred forward quickly at the same moment and reached the spot before the royal pavilion just as hugh de mothama paused there also now hugh now cried the prince what is all this but first my good lord he continued extending his hand to the old earl welcome back to your duty and to england my lord the king may not your son promise this gentleman grace and pardon it is probable that at any other time henry would not have yielded without much entreaty but at this moment he was too eager for explanations to hesitate and bowing his head he replied well be it so what now my lord said hugh i come before your grace to prove my innocence as may seem fit unto your grace to order either in arms according to the challenge given or by still better proof if so you will none can be better sir answered the king god's own decision must surely be more just than that of men well sire replied hugh de mothama with a smile be it as your grace pleases allured he continued holding out his hand if i needs must fight with you i must but you will be compelled to seek some other cause than your good father's death of that at least i am innocent whatever i be guilty of here is a witness cannot lie draw back the curtains will you believe himself allured to ashby already pale turned for an instant paler still but it seemed as if the blood had but withdrawn itself into the fountain of the heart to gush forth again purified renewed invigorated for a moment he was as white as the ashes of an extinguished fire but the next his cheek glowed his eyes sparkled and springing from his horse with a light bound as if all sickness were departed he cast himself upon his knees beside the litter in which lying on a soft bed but partly raised upon his arms appeared the old earl of ashby the son dewed the father's hands with his tears then starting up and casting his arms round hugh de mothama he pressed him to his mailed breast exclaiming i have injured you forgive me my good brother hugh wrung his hand and said this is all joyful allured but there is something painful still behind there stand the murderers the assassin and his tool my lord the king into your hands i give them to be dealt with as in your high judgment you shall deem expedient the one makes full confession of his crime the other has not the daring to deny it and indeed it would be useless to do so for as the very consequences of our sins prove often by god's will their punishments a poor unhappy girl whom he seduced from virtue and her peaceful home overheard in his house the full conspiracy for murdering this good earl and charging the crime on me she told it to those she thought might best prevent it who came not in time to stop the deed but soon enough to find the earl and staunch the bleeding of his wounds before life was extinct she is now ready though her heart is broke to give such evidence as leaves no doubt of these men's guilt even if they still denied it oh villain said allured de ashby gazing on his cousin who still looked fiercely from under his frowning brows upon him oh villain to bring such a stain upon our house hush allured hush said the old earl i will beseech my lord the king to pardon him ay pardon me pardon me cried richard de ashby darting forward king i saved your son from bondage i gave him means of flight but for me there had been no evesham but for me de montfort had still ruled but for me you have both been prisoners at this hour 
"'What say you, Edward?' asked the king. "'I beseech you, my lord, pardon him, pardon him,' exclaimed Mortimer and Pembroke in a breath. "'My lord, I dare not speak,' said Edward, "'for though justice calls for the death of the blackest villain I ever did yet know, "'gratitude ties my tongue. I must not speak.' "'Untie his hands,' cried the king, after a moment's pause. "'We give him life, but banish him the realm for ever. "'If in ten days he be found within the seas, let him be put to death.' "'Thanks, my lord, thanks,' exclaimed Richard de Ashby, "'while the yeoman unwillingly loosened his arms from the cords. "'As soon as he was free, he passed his cousin and Hugh de Mothimer, "'as if to cut straight across the lists. "'But when he had taken two or three steps, "'he turned and shook his clenched fist at them, crying, "'Curses upon you both! "'But the time for vengeance may yet come. "'I have not done with you.' "'Even while he spoke, "'there was a little movement amongst the crowd beyond the barriers, "'and as he turned again to pursue his way, a loud, clear, powerful voice, which was heard echoing over the whole field, exclaimed in the English tongue, "'This for the heart of the murderous traitor Richard de Ashby, whom kings spare, commons send to judgment.' None saw the man from whom the voice proceeded, but the moment after there came a sharp sound, like the twang of bowstring, the whistle of a shaft through the air, and then a dull stroke such as an arrow makes when it hits a target. A shrill scream, like that of a wounded sea-bird, burst from the lips of Richard de Ashby, and casting up his arms in the air, as if in the effort to clutch at something for support, he fell back upon the grass. Several persons ran up, but he was dead. The arrow had gone through and through his heart, and between the peacock feathers that winged it on its way was found written, Robin Hood. Almost at the same moment a tall, stout yeoman was seen to mount a white horse at the other side of the lists, and ride away from the field. He proceeded at no very quick pace, and as he went, he hummed lightly to some old, long-forgotten air. And this is the end of Robin Lythe and his knave Gandaline. End of chapter 44 End of Forest Days, A Romance of Old Times by George Payne Rainsford James